7.09 on Saturday, February 2nd, 2013. And this is the Salim Wakil Show on the Talk of Chicago, 1690 WVON. To stream online, just go to www.wvon.com. If you hear my voice, then you know that you have reached that place where we reflect on the news of the week and try to find our place in the mix. What we want to do is to provoke informative, entertaining, and uh, useful conversation. It's important to me that we do all of that with respect, and we need your help on that. Uh, We want to be a model of respectful conversation. So I want to know if you are ready to flex the muscles in your mind because of the seven on Saturday is time for a Salim. And you all know what to do. Just join in, pick up the phone, and give me a call at 1773-591-1690. It's good to be with you tonight on this um, this first show of the month designated Black History Month. Uh, There's much in the news deserving of exploration this evening, including um, the French military's ouster of the jihadist forces uh, that had taken over and occupied northern Mali for the last year. Uh, It was an ironic spectacle yesterday when French President Francois Hollande strolled through the Malian crowds like a conquering hero. And uh, he was being treated just like that by the crowds. Um, but that was just, a, you know, another case to, to, to prove that, uh, as one of my Facebook posters put it, anything is possible. Although the French apparently have succeeded in pushing the Islamists out, there is little confidence that they will stay away. The region remains much too volatile for any kind of stable relationships between many of the contending forces, especially the Tuareg of the north and the Bambara and Songhai uh, of, the, of the south, Melinda, and other dark-skinned ethnicities of the south. Uh, there's always been this, this um, division between the Sahil, Saharan, and Sub-Saharan folk, and that division is likely to persist. Also, we will, you know, we can discuss the confirmation of Senator Kerry as the new Secretary of State and the contentious confirmation hearings of Chuck Hagel as the new Secretary of Defense. Many analysts speculated that the GOP wanted Kerry as Secretary of State rather than Susan Rice because they coveted Kerry's Senate seat. And they speculated that Republican Scott Brown had a good shot at occupying it, Um, but apparently they were wrong because Brown recently announced that he wouldn't seek the seat. So it's likely to stay in the hands of the Democrats, which is something the Republicans did not want. Um, As for the confirmation hearings for uh, former Kansas Senator Chuck Hagel, a Republican, it seemed as if he were auditioning for the most slavish protector of Israel rather than for the Secretary of Defense for the United States of America. Israel was mentioned 178 times, according to the Washington Post. Al-Qaeda was mentioned twice. Libya and Benghazi, which everybody was was up in arms about, was mentioned three times. And uh, drones, not at all. Other important issues like the budget, veterans, the growing problem of suicide, all of that was barely mentioned at all. Um, Israel was mentioned 178 times. Um, and, and when, when the other subjects were mentioned, they were mentioned by Democrats who were trying to make the hearings appear to be relevant to the actual job of the defense secretary. Um, although, uh, you know, most pundits are predicting Hegel's confirmation, few expected the kind of hostile questioning that he received, especially from uh, fellow Republicans. And, and, and the domination of Israel as a major bone of contention actually was embarrassing for, uh, for, for the proceedings of a, of a nation that is supposedly concerned with his own um, well-being. Um, were these Republican senators capable of, of embarrassment, they, they, would, they would be embarrassed. But I don't know if they, per- if they can actually perceive that. Um, indeed, we can talk about many other things as well. But tonight, 
Tonight, we're going to focus on issues related to the gunshot killing of 15-year-old Hadia Pendleton. And uh, as she and a bunch of students took shelter from the rain in the park in Bronzeville, the killing had um, an enormous impact, primarily because the teenager had just returned from an appearance at the second inaugural ceremony of President Barack Obama. Um, and, uh, you know, it's one of those perhaps uh, seminal moments, certainly a teachable moment, but it's a, a moment we all want to reflect on and see if we can get something together to marshal up the wherewithal to figure out a way to deal with these problems because they are absolutely exasperating. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it's, you know, you, we see the same pattern, prayer vigils, marches, calls for this and calls for that. But, you know, I've been covering this stuff for many, many years since I've been in Chicago. And every so often there's a seminal murder, seminal outrage, and we get up, we get upset, we march, we mobilize for a few weeks, and people cry and uh, you know, it all dies down, and 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 it and it, the pattern is repeated. Ultimately, well, tonight we're going to talk to a few people to see if we can at least look at one aspect of this. We're going to talk to a photographer, filmmaker, internet consultant, a web designer, multimedia specialist Floyd Webb. Joining him will be actor, director, producer, and casting director. Paimon Rami, who is also the director of programs and projects for the uh, DuSabo Museum. And uh, joining us also will be Grammy, uh, Grammy winning uh, hip hop artist, who is also a community activist and former candidate for Alderman, Che Rhymefest Smith. Um, and we're going to together you know, discuss uh, what's going on uh, in terms of uh, the images. Uh, the way images are, are, are projected in, in, in our in our media, and uh, we're going to mine the intellects of these outstanding brothers for some nuggets of wisdom to help us survive and even maybe thrive uh, during these currently dismal times. Uh, so we're going to focus on issues of media images and the arts, film, and music, and how or if they think that this issue can. Um, can help deal with uh, the current crisis of violent crime in our communities. So that's what we're going to be focusing on primarily this evening. So before, we, but we, before we do that, we're going to give you a chance just to, you know, talk about what's on the top of your head. Um, and uh, and and at about seven thirty or so, we're going to shift uh, to this discussion with the brothers. So give us a call again at seven seven three five nine one sixty ninety, and let's go straight to the phones. Anita, good evening. How are you, my sister? Aisalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. How are you doing, Salim? I'm doing well. <laughs> oh boy, everybody must have missed you Wednesday. You had so many callers. I didn't even get on Wednesday. Yeah, it was packed. It really was packed. Yeah. Yeah, we're an hour ahead here, so uh -huh. I called about eight thirty, maybe eight forty, so I didn't get on. Mm -hmm. uh, don't hog the time, everybody. When we have Miss Celine because of the basketball, uh, is yeah, that basketball that comes on on Wednesday? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, we all miss uh, Celine too. The ones that did not get on the show Wednesday. I'm just teasing your audience, okay. but uh, but still, yeah, um, I'm. I've missed being on, on Wednesdays. Anyway, we want you to know that. But I guess Obama's followers have found out that he's not God the Redeemer, you know. I mean, even if you follow him closely and you participate with him, that's not going to spare your life. So I hope people have learned that Obama isn't this uh, savior that they're trying to put him up to being that you know, Obama still has to do his human work on this earth, like all the rest of us, to, you know, stop unnecessary violence in our community. You know, he's not going to just appear to be black and that's going to solve everything. He actually got to put some legwork in. Well, you know, uh, they, 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 had a, they, they had a news, a news conference today at the site where Hadia was murdered, and I think the Reverend Jackson called for him to come to Chicago. 
and 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 uh, you know say some some soothing words to, to to folks in his old neighborhood because that happened not far from where he lives, where mm-hmm. he used to live. So, mm-hmm. and, and you know, I'm gonna tell you something. When people put themselves up as something outside of God, and not saying Obama does that, but you know, he is he is riding on that that cloud there. Mm. You know, I, I noticed some some not too good things happen to these people. So I, I've noticed it with a lot of women. They go out there and throw themselves out there as the bombshell. A whole bunch of them ended up with cancer. So <laughs> uh, I don't okay, know if it's Anita, silicone I'm, I'm, or what. We don't have much so time for, for the caller, so I'm going to have to accelerate okay. y- your, your comments. Okay, and... you're going to accelerate me today. Okay. <laughs> yes, man. Thank but you. But see, th- that's what I wanted to say pretty much was about Obama and All right. you know, people you. holding him up as equal to Jesus. All right. Thank you, my sister. All right. Equal to Jesus. Okay, let's go to Mike. Hey, Mike. How you doing, man? Yeah, Selene. Yes, sir. Yeah, last week uh, Larry called in and you and him were having a discussion about females uh, getting into combat. Yes. And you said that you were in agreement with that. With, with what? And, with females? With women going into combat. Um. Yeah. I, well, yeah. I, I, you did agree with that. Is that correct? I, I'm, I'm not, you know... <laughs> I'm not. Oh, you're, you're not sure this week. Huh? Well, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm not really. I'm not really um, fervent one way or the other. But if they decided that it's good, it's a good idea. I don't see anything wrong with it, man. If they if they've, de- if they've considered all of the variables and have decided it's a good idea, and I see other armed forces is around around the world also do it. So why not, well, man? Well, uh-huh. well my question is: Did you agree that women should be in combat? Because that was the under, that that was how I took it when you said that you you didn't have a problem with it. Uh, I, yeah, I, I don't have a problem with it. Okay, let, let, let's settle on that. I don't have a problem with it. Okay, well, well, I'm, I'm in partial agreement. With, I think that it's okay for Caucasian women to go into combat and die, mm-hmm. and perhaps for people that you might love to go in combat and die. But I don't think it's okay for women in general to go in combat and die for the various reasons that Larry mentioned. They aren't prepared for combat. Okay. But I think white women are more than equal to the task and that they should go You think so? Right you, th- you know, in fact, I, I would, I, and I even disagree, I kind of disagree with that. I think that black women are, um, are more able to become uh, to, to to mobilize in, in, in physical ways than 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 white because does that includes your daughters. For for one thing, you know, science has, my, uh, science has shown us that um, that that, that black women have more testosterone to uh, more, more more so um, in in terms of their their general hormonal makeup than white women and so that that would re- they, they they have more upper body strength as a rule and so i think if you're going to go just by that um black women would be more uh, suitable uh to, to be in combat but if, you, if you're talking about maybe political political reasons or or whatever uh, racial whatever whatever you seem to be whatever hobby horse you seem to be riding perhaps no Maybe not black women, but in terms of uh, anatomical capabilities, I think black women are much more capable. Does that include your daughters? Um, <laughs> if my daughters want to do it, yes. If they don't want to, no. Uh-huh. Anything, anything else, brother? I think you need to examine what you just said because okay. that is quite... All right. Uh, let's go to... Uh, <laughs> Dwight. Hey, Dwight. What's up, brother? Hotel. Hotel. Uh, let's see. Is, is it okay if I call back uh, after the brothers uh, start their flow about the images? Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. It is. That's cool. Okay. Right. I'll, I'll hang up. All right. Man. Uh-huh. Let's go to uh, Mansong. Mansong. Hey, brother. Hotel. Hey, Hotel. Right back at you, brother. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, you, did you get that? Uh, I did get it, man. It was, it was uh, very entertaining. Right on. Yes, sir. That's your Kuzan Lee while president. <laughs> All right, man. That's cool. I appreciate that. Hey, listen. Um, I just um, wanted to uh, get in early and uh, just, you know, of course, remind folk that uh, we're dramatized in our history in the month of February, but it's really 365. Yes, sir. But we need to dramatize, you know, with the space that we've carved out for this month. So there were a couple of... Uh, 
things that I, I needed to uh, share with your audience. Uh, y'all know uh, Zakia Muhammad and uh, that young brother Brandon Durham. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, Sister Barbara Baker in Cobra. Mm -hmm. And I know y'all know Harold Lucas. Well, they have something in common, and there's a couple others. But um, the uh, Temple of Mercy Association, Salim, is having that 23rd uh, Black Heritage Banquet, mm -hmm. you know, coming up in a couple of weeks, February 16th. Mm -hmm. and it's, of course, going to be at the, uh, the uh, Masonic, you know, Prince Mason Hall yes, over there right on 42nd and Cottage, uh, 42nd Place and Cottage. And uh, they've been having it there. And uh, they're going to have uh, Brother Benny Lee, uh, the keynote speaker, and the theme is the criminalization of the black race. Mm. But they also, Celine, will be having their community active, activist awards. And y'all know how Zakia Muhammad has been on the case yes. all these years. And uh, Sister Barbara Baker winning Cobra and the reparations. Mm -hmm. And the young brother, you know, he's the young brother, Brandon, is getting the Chairman Fred Hampton Sr. Award. All right, all you right. Know? And, uh, of course... Um, Zakia is getting the Marion and Zynga Stamps Award. Oh, yeah, that's, that's appropriate. And Barbara Baker of Encobra, the Beauty Turner Award. All right, all right. And uh, Harold Lucas will be getting the Lou Palmer Award. <laughs> Go ahead. You know, so, you know, <laughs> I would like folks to uh, uh, plan to, to attend. Okay, quick, quickly, man. Where, where is it and what time again? Okay, it's going to be... Saturday, February 16th, mm -hmm. 6 p.m. to 10 p.m., and dinner is served at 7 p.m. Uh, you can call this number for further information. Okay. Uh, this is um, Minister Rahim Atan. Okay. 773-846-3077. Uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, where's it going to be again? What's the location? The Prince Hall Banquet Room. That's the Masonic Temple uh -huh. at 809 East 42nd Place, which is 42nd in Cottage Grove. All right, bro. Okay? Yes, sir. Thank you, Appreciate man. Appreciate you me do that, brother. Okay. Right on. All right, let's go to Sarah real quick. Sarah, hey, my sister. Hey, greetings to you, brother. To me. And greetings and, uh, to you. To the, to the VON family. Tell Jay that when I, I'm, I told my husband I was going to cuss him out because he got me running around here for some dog or peanut oil to, to mix, fry some chicken. Uh-huh. Because so, <laughs> <laughs> he told him that the fryer would not work with olive oil. So I'm running into all these dog on stores to return to olive oil to get peanut to oil. To get peanut oil, oil huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on, a, on a tip now, for, for this, quickly what I wanted to say um. I mean, the situation with this president and his pandering to these, um, to the NRA people, because I don't know if you saw that picture with him released with him with that weapon. With skeet, skeet so shooting. With skeet shooting. Mm -hmm. You know, this, 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 this is ridiculous, Salim. What more does this man need <laughs> to do in order to show these people that he's a butterfly fight on um, black men or whatever the heck it is? You know, like, like every other opportunity that they tell him, to, to um to jump and touch his stoves or whatever he, he he's doing it. <laughs> so, so you, you know, I, I'm embarrassed for y'all for y'all black men because this man is taking y'all down some from some serious notches, and it makes no sense. Well, you know, you know, um. I, I'm I'm inclined to to, to, to agree. I mean, it, it is it is pretty embarrassing the way he is pandering to these particular groups. But Matt, but 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 Sarah, this is political. This is political calculation, and I, he he's a political animal, man. He and, and I think he's just doing what he has to do in order to to you know to maintain his whatever edge, whatever capital political cap, capital he's trying to. Um, you know, to hold on to, to harbor. You know? But, but his legacy is going to be one of a panderer. Because first of all, with the Clinton situation and also a death, now this, this photo up with the, with, with, for the NRA, then with, with the immigration reform running itself down to um, Nevada, the post with the Latinos, this is totally disgraceful. And, you, you know, I'm going to throw my hands up in the air. Let me go on up in there and let it spill it all and tell Jay I owe him one. And it ain't good. <laughs> uh, I'll talk with y'all on Wednesday. <laughs> all right, 
sir. Thank you, my sister. <laughs> uh, well, hey, um, she's not alone in those feelings, you know. The brother, I mean, <clears throat> you know, this, this is this is the new um, the new term, right? He he he's supposedly free. He has no electoral concerns at this point. Uh, and yet, I think we can get one more one more in here. Jay, hey, brother, hotel. Hotel, Queen, Queen Mother Sarah, as a semi-chef, <laughs> you cannot use olive oil in a deep fry. You must use either vegetable, cordola, or peanut. And peanut is the best out of all three. You can save it and use it a couple of times, my African queen. <laughs> Listen, to me, mm -hmm. I really wanted to speak to your, your guest because... I, I, I'm at the point now to where I think I may have to stop blaming Obama for the plight and the conditions of our people and start blaming us. Mm. Because it's going to take us to stand up and do something about this this murder that's going on in our community. So look, He's you want to... You, you want to... You cops in our neighborhood. You want to... You uh, tell, tell me this, Jay. Do you want to... Do you want to... Um, uh, forfeit your conversation now and call back when the brothers are on? Yeah, I, I, I'll forfeit and I'll, and I'll call back because I, <laughs> I definitely want to speak to him about All right. It. But Jay, okay. Um, all right, let's just see if we can get Larry. Larry, hey, man, how you doing? Larry, yeah, I've, been trying, I've been trying to call you, Larry, and and, and you're, you, never, you never answer. It's always, you got this very authoritarian sounding uh, um, voicemail. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I haven't cleared it. I get so many calls, man. I got to clear them up like right away, and if you know, clear them out, they clog up. So I will do that. But uh, you, you, you give me a way in which I can contact you. I will return your call. Okay. Um. All right. Uh, but, I'll, but, I'll, uh huh. But I would like to say, you know, just in passing, and yeah. that like get my main point, and that yes. is that I, I, in 26 years of active duty and National Guard military experience, including a unit that was integrating women into it, I didn't see any advantage for black women over white women. I'm just telling you. You didn't? Okay. 26 years of careful observation. Mm -hmm. There essentially was no difference in the capabilities of black women and white women. When I, I, I remember, I graded physical training tests. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'm just telling you, ain't no. Well, I'm, glad, I, I, I'm, glad, I'm glad you offered that, because I, I, I really had no way of comparing. Comparing. It's just that I know that, I, that, that there is some evidence that black women have a higher degree of testosterone. Well, well, well that may be a specific individual black mm. woman, but I don't know if that's generally true. Mm. I'm telling you, both of them are generally unsuitable for the task of a combat soldier. That okay. I can guarantee you. All right. Now, now, uh, let me let me go on with this issue of, of, of you know, uh, blacks and, and being killed and, and with Obama and the poor young girl having attended his inauguration uh, mm -hmm, perform. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I think that's entirely suitable since people like him are responsible for much of the killing of the black man. I'm not saying he is directly, but people who support his policies that destroyed the two-parent black family are, and they are mainly socialists and Democrats. Well, you now... Let you mean me, like the welfare policies and yes, the, sir, the, absolutely. Well, 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 wasn't it conservative? Weren't what weren't, weren't um, conservatives the one responsible for inserting that prohibition on having a man in the? Fa in uh, uh, the they were partially responsible for it, but believe me, uh, the main responsibility goes with socialists generally. Same thing <laughs> happened in East Germany. So you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's no different. Whatever you implement, it's kind of probably destroy the, the family. But look, let, let me go on with. Uh, a little a little epiphany, one of my epiphanous moments, you know, like many of the epiphanous moments that turned me to a conservative from a liberal. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what one of the most important lessons I learned as a police officer. Now, do you remember a little girl named, I believe her name was Diamond Bradley. She was three yes. years old. She got killed in a crossfire in the playground at the Abla Homes in the 1990s, or late uh, 80s and late 1990s. I don't know if you remember that, but I remember quite well, because I was involved directly in it. And what happened was, um, we, we developed some information indicating that there was a young man who was not directly involved in the shooting, but he knew who was. And we got this boy, and we decided to let the city TAC officers come along and talk to him. Mm -hmm. So we were holding him for them. And I struck up a conversation with this boy. He was 16 or 17 years old. And I was talking, I was saying, now look, y'all, when y'all get the shooting up here, you know, and, and these little kids are out there, well, why aren't you more careful? To not get them caught in a crossfire, you know, and, and, and be more cautious and make sure you at least 
only shoot your antagonist. Mm -hmm. And the boy looked at me without a hint of irony, without a hint of, uh, I'm just pulling your leg, I'm trying to jive you because you know, you, you, you the police and you know, I, you know. No, he looked at me directly in the eye. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, well, look here, man. These <laughs> people up in here, they know what time it is. When they hear the shooting, they're supposed to get out the way. <laughs> now, 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 listen to me, that's Salim. Pretty, that's he was good, serious. Man. He was not kidding. Uh -huh. I looked at this boy and I realized. I, I've been going. That was a pretty good uh, depiction, man. I, 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 I'm, I'm proud. Because it sticks in my mind. Oh, okay. I can hear him. I can see him. As clear as when he said it to me, Salim. Okay. And, and I looked at this boy and I realized. I, I had been assuming that many of the people who do these kind of things share the same ethics and values that you and I do. And we have a generally common ground and basis for discussion. Mm -hmm. And after talking to him a bit further, I realized we didn't. Mm -hmm. It was like talking to somebody from another planet. <laughs> and it made me a better police officer to realize people like him existed. I was able to make more arrests. I was able to deal better with these guys. I had a much be better basis for understanding of the criminal element with which I was opposed. Once you and the, and the once you other them. corruption <laughs> that occurred to the black community in the time when I was growing up to the time I was working out there as a cop. Mm. I'm saying it was most, one of the most valuable lessons of my life as my career as a police officer. You mean because you, you realize that you have an alternative value system. Is that Yes, that? yes oh. sir. Absolutely. Mm. Okay. And I think the minute we all accept this and stop trying to pretend that everybody in the United States is at equal risk of homicide or causing a homicide, we will be better off. This is not a universal problem with the American people yet. Yes. It is a problem with a specific subset yes, sir. of people within, particularly in the Hispanic and black community, of the ages from uh, 18 to 34 and mm. probably younger. Yes, I, I think and you're right, man. We I understand I, 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 that we will not fix it. All right, Larry. I, I tend, uh, un, you know, amazingly, I tend to agree with what you're saying. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. All right, Larry. Um, all right, folks. Um, my guests are here and raring to go. I could, I could see, I could see uh, the fire uh, smoldering in their consciousness. So um, with, with me this evening is Paimon Rami, who is, um, uh, he's a multimedia lecturer as well, just, just like uh, Floyd. I, I talked about Floyd a little earlier being multimedia. Paimon is multimedia, he's an actor, producer, director. He was a casting director. And now he's a director of uh, programs and uh, whatnot for, for DuSable Museum. Um, and he's, he's joining us tonight. And we're going to, you know, uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of his um, areas of expertise in, in terms of imagery. Uh, joining Pei Moon is um, uh, 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 Che Reinfest-Smith. You know him well, I'm sure. He's a Grammy-winning rap artists. Uh, um, I think a lyrical genius myself. That's my own uh, personal opinion from listening to his two albums. And he's also uh, uh, a community activist and he ran for alderman um, and came pretty close to winning in uh, you know the last election. So he's with, he's with, uh, with us tonight going to talk a little bit about music and what the imagery is going on, what, what's happening among young people and the kind of music that they listen to and how that's affecting this, this crisis that we're currently in. And Floyd Webb, who is a um, photographer, filmmaker, uh, internet uh, web designer, multimedia consultant, another renaissance man in terms of the arts. He's with us tonight. Floyd, uh, good evening, my brother. Glad you could join us. Paymon, Thanks good evening. Me. It's a pleasure being here, sitting with you four gentlemen, and being on your show. Well, it's a pleasure to have you, brother. And Rhyme Fest, how yes, you doing, sir. My Yes, sir. It's an honor to be here, always to be with you, my brother. Yes. Sir. And with your audience. I got to admit, I'm a little more intimidated by your audience than I am of you. <laughs> <laughs> you just like I am. <laughs> they don't play, man. Um, they don't play. Especially um, Sister Sarah. You heard some of her. A little oh, bit. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so, you know... Um, Let's start this off, man. Um, the Hadia Pendleton thing. I mean, uh, she was shot. A lot of people don't know why. Uh, they were speculating at first it was some gang connection, but now it looks increasingly, increasingly like some guy was shooting at another, uh, you know, um, uh, somebody he was angry at, and he just hit these folks by mistake. That's one. That's one uh, story. The other story I heard is just 
got, apparently is jealous of, of, of high achieving teens and just got out of the car and started shooting. Um, w- what story have you heard? Anybody heard? Uh, yeah, well, you know, I, I, my, by my wife being uh, working uh, at Whitney Young High School, I mean, mm-hmm. she has children that are in her class that come in and say, well, I knew Idea, and, and that was a friend of mine, and, you know, and they talk to their parents, and they talk, but, but they don't talk to the police. They don't talk to uh, the authorities that could, you know, maybe use the information. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and what my wife telling me she's, she's hearing from the young people is is that you know this was a person that is usually seen in the community in, in that community oh, you know really? yeah. and, and so uh th- there are young people who know who it is that mm. did it you mm. know what I mean and mm. they've seen that person often and that are just too afraid to speak and there may be even some parents that say hey don't say anything because his friends may come after after you and you have to go to this school every day you know that's a hell so, of a reality though yeah that, that mm-hmm. is a reality and, and that's just what I'm hearing Mm-hmm. One of the young ladies, this is Pamela, one of the young ladies that was with her at the time was one of the teen docents at the DuSable Museum um, when we had the program a few months ago. Okay. And uh, we had a chance to not only see her on TV, but uh, to interact. According to her story, uh, they were just there, and it was random that he just jumped over his fence, started shooting at them. Wow. And um, mm-hmm. she didn't get shot, but her boot you know, the, one of the bullets grazed her boot. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I, I just want to say that there is a need for our children to have value for life or for mm-hmm. our people to have value. And at some point we have to look at where that value comes from. Because when you, when you say that life is no more important than stepping on, someone stepping on your gym shoe or you're being insulted <coughs> or you're being disrespected, um, then we have a lot of work to do in terms of reconstructing. And I know one of your callers uh, earlier talked about value systems. And and we have to look at where those value systems come from and how we reconstruct the minds of our children that have been damaged severely from a number of different things, poor education, media, uh, all types of influences. Well, where can we we most effectively intervene, uh, do you think, Pamela? I think part of it is, is being able to recognize truth and not being afraid to deal with the issues that are addressed in in the media. Because somewhere along the line, someone said, you're playing the race card. Mm -hmm. And when they begin to use the term playing the race card, we begin to construct in our minds that racism is a game. And so we become (laughs) scared of responding to things for fear that someone is going to accuse us Mm -hmm. of talking about that which is real. And so we, we sort of run away from it. And so when, and we, we are so driven by wanting to see ourselves, by wanting to feel ourselves, by wanting to feel good, that we don't want to dissect those images that are in front of us that are negative and destructive. Mm. I was talking to a brother the other day about Beast of the Wild. Mm-hmm. And everybody's raving about this film. But when you look at it, it's, it borders on child abuse. Mm. When you look at it, when you really look at it, there's a, there's a loving scene at the end, but this guy runs away from his kid, leaves her in the house. He burns down the house. He's being miseducated. She's being taught to be beastie. The last thing our community needs mm. is well, you, for our girls to be taught to be beastie. And, you know, I, I would agree with you, Pam, on that, that there is a lack of truth <clears throat> where I think that I may differ a, a little a bit is when we talk about racism as the uh, primary issue uh, when it comes to how we communicate in, in art, I, I look at it as though young people are not being truthful and honest with themselves in the art that they produce. So one of the things that we see uh, in the young people today, I mean, they see Chief Keith gets a, a record deal for a million dollars, right? Mm-hmm. And the record deal that he gets is based off of lies. And what do I mean by lies? He's not telling the truth about his situation. He's not saying, I got a sister or a brother that I love that I want to protect. I got a grandmother who's been raising me in lieu of my mom being on drugs. He's saying, I I bang, I kill, mm-hmm. man, this is what I don't like, not what anything that I do like. So he's not giving a whole honest uh, a balanced view, a balanced view of what mm-hmm. his life really is. So then the young people say, well, he got a million dollars for lying. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then and then that becomes the primary uh, driving force behind. Well, this is how I have to rap. This is how yeah. I have to shoot a film. Mm-hmm. This is how you know. Oh, oh, Chicago is the most violent place. That becomes uh, the younger you are, the more of a badge of honor. That is because now someone will sympathize with my apathy. Mm-hmm. And, and so, and, and I found this even when I ran for office, people find solace in apathy. And so, I guess when I when I'm looking at, at truth, <laughs> well, mm-hmm. you know, when, when I'm when I'm looking, people hide behind apathy. Mm-hmm. So when I'm looking at truth, I don't see uh, our problem being the we can't even get to the racism part because we can't get to the truth. Of our own situation, I know people that they'll they'll hit a thirty thousand dollar lick and think they're rich. Yeah, but mm. but when I refer to racism, I'm talking about self hate and the racism that mm. uh, that affords us the opportunity to continue to perpetuate things about us that push us deeper into the well. Mm-hmm. And so, where we cannot construct a, a reality that says, you know, that there's some white people someplace that are trying to make us do something, what we can say is that we have been so driven by the fact that we want to succeed. A lot of us don't don't want to be successful. We want to be accepted. And so as a result of that, we will we will c- create the lie. We work with teenagers all the time and I I raised a question with them. What would you do if somebody brought brought to you some money and said, "I want you to do something that's against what you believe in?" 90% of them say, "Well, I take the money and then somewhere down the line I would try to bring the truth yes. back into the yes. reality of mm-hmm. it." Because yes. we have we have been Constructed in this idea that our values can be set aside long enough for us to be economically well, successful. Not only constructed, uh, Payman, but we, that's how we live. I mean, if we don't have the money, we, we can't we can't survive. And, and so, I mean, it, it's more than simply um, uh, you know a duplicitous kind of mindset. It's a necessity that we have we, we have to be mercenaries in many ways. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, well, I think if you, if you look at it, and I can speak just from a hip hop standpoint, uh, if you look at groups like Outkast, you know mm-hmm. the the first album, Southern Playalistic Cadillac, mm-hmm. funky music, and and the way that came across to me when I was a young person was here's a Southern group doing some pimp stuff, mm-hmm. and I didn't like it. But what did happen was I grew with Outkast over the years, and their sound did evolve. Uh, I think what you find is that with success. Artists must evolve. I'm, you know, I just returned from Paris with with Kanye, and I'm listening to his music, and he's getting ready to come with songs like "I Am a God," "Black Skinhead," uh, 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 "New New Slave." Like, you know, so as an artist, he is evolving mm. from even Watch the Throne. So this makes young people think that perhaps the ends can justify the means, although they don't see how an artist uh, such as one who just down in the dirt has to always too short cannot evolve because mm. it will not be accepted that an artist is so pimpish is too short could be anything other than that. Who's yeah, but that was his, his whole image was too. <laughs> he had no nuance. Yeah, 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 exactly. Too short is never a pimp. For Floyd, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, being in Oakland, I can tell you, Too Short was well managed by his mom. Was he? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just saw Too Short with Kevin and, 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 and I love Too Short. <laughs> I just saw him in this in this in this uh, 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 Documentary that that ice that that uh, um, ice, ice tea ice tea did yeah, <laughs> yeah not ice cube I love right, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and he was it was interesting the comments he made yeah. uh, he, he's more reflective than I had yeah. given him credit for oh yeah but, but, but he's but, always but, been thoughtful he's but Floyd been, um, oh, yeah. Paymon said something you know specifically he was talking about the beast of the southern wild yeah. it made me think that you know there are different ways of evaluating. These Absolutely. Works of art. Absolutely. And, and should you and and um, how does I mean because uh, I mean well, I'm, look, go ahead, speak okay. on it. Mm-hmm. I'm rural, right? I'm born in Mississippi. Mm-hmm. I'm born and raised in Mississippi, right? I'm in touch with various communities, you know, in the South from traveling with my grandmother who sold insurance and my grandfather who would go to Arkansas a lot. So you see different things, and I remember stuff, and you know the film. It showed me things that I remembered. You know, mm-hmm. it reminded me of things. Not things exactly like that, but communities like that. But, you know, mm-hmm. com- communities that are set apart from what we call civilization. You know? Yeah, the bathtub. And, and these people, about right, 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 the bathtub. I mean, where I'm from, population 1,200 in the middle of a cotton field, five miles out of the biggest city, which was Clarksdale, Mississippi, right? And it's an 
community well, unto you're a real itself. Country boy, ain't you? Well, you know, I know it on show, but yeah, that's, <laughs> no, that's the, right. That's the deal. You have you an ur- you have an urbane. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, but see, you got to understand something about being from Mississippi, right? When you escape a black hole, you got to have velocity, right? Woo, and that's hole. like, yeah. you know, like this is like uh, my grandmother was educated at Tuskegee. She was named after Portia, after after Booker T. Washington's daughter, right? Uh, my grandfather was a fundraiser for Tuskegee. And my grandmother married down. She married down to a uh, illiterate sharecropper, mm. right? Got ex got excommunicated from up. the middle class, you, mm. know, you know. But it's it's like, so when I see something like that, I'm reminded of the things that I saw, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that we read too much into this thing about we're talking about people trying to survive, right? And this thing about the little girl being taught to be beastly, I don't think so. I think it's a I think it's metaphor. You know what I mean? I, I don't think, I can't take it that seriously, just like I can't take Django seriously. You know, this stuff is fantasy. This stuff is a metaphor. How we interpret these images is, you know, we, we get out of something what we bring to it. You know, so I, don't, so I don't see these things as dangerous because, like, you know, I grew up around guns. I grew up around a lot of guns. I had a BB gun, right? And when, and if I behave with that BB gun, what happened? I lost it, right? But I was taught about guns because mm-hmm. I was I was wrong. I don't know anybody. I don't I I don't know nobody in Mississippi. Ain't nobody in Mississippi that I know that I grew up with ever shot anybody. And we all had access to guns, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We have to look. We have to look at this in a different way. We have to, you know, we tend to be ahistorical about these things too. We tend to look at the symptoms, you know. We tend to look at the effects, but we never look at at like root causes, you know, like like one of my main criticisms of that film, uh, uh, the uh, interrupters, you know, yeah, it's, it's like, did all of you see the interrupters? The, yeah, the interrupters. Yeah, mm-hmm. nobody ever mentioned where are these guns coming from, right? How are these guns getting into the community? You know, wh- how is it that these guns are like, you know, they're like every place all the time. You know, and, and then the encouragement. I, I, I wrote a post yesterday. You know, I was think, thinking about this whole violence thing. And I remember growing, growing up and, you know, I, I used to visit 63rd Blackstone, man. And I remember, like, conflict back there was mano a mano, right? That stuff tended to do with, with like, dignity, personal honor. You could win or lose it based on the kind of conflict. But very few people went to the, you know, I mean, 63rd Blackstone, you, you, you know, that's like Blackstone Ranger, mm-hmm. right? But very few people lost their lives behind that stuff, right? And there's an evolution. There's there's an evolution. I mean, like the only guns we had was zip guns. You mm-hmm. couldn't get a gun, right? It wasn't until Reagan repealed the uh, the uh, gun laws, right, that that we really got an influx of guns in in our co- 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 community. But we we've got to look at like the uh, uh, the uh, loss of the extended family. Right, because where where would I be without an extended family? You know what I mean. My father goes to Vietnam. My, luckily, my my mother had seven brothers. Right. Then when my but at the same time I had teachers. Right. I had teachers in the public school system. If you, you were you sharp, went, you if went you to were school sharp, in Mississippi. Uh, I went to school in Mississippi, but then when I came, I went to Haines School at Chinatown. Right. Mm. But they took over when my father went to Vietnam. They jumped in. They said, "Okay, you you kind of sharp. We're gonna look after you." So I had so I was looked after by my teacher Melvin Gaynor at Haines School. Mm. Then he sent me over. Then he would then he 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 kept me out of trouble by sending me to the uh, Garfield Park field house to, to 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 study carpentry with one of his friends who taught at Limbloom. When I got to Limbloom, guess who my home teacher was? Who, who my homeroom teacher? Same cat I had at the uh, Mr. English. So, so you, you had, know what I mean? You had that, so I had, had these, paternal influence. I had this paternal influence, but this was a common thing mm-hmm. that we mentored. That now, what year, what year are you talking about? I'm talking 1960. What I, I I came here in 1958, so I moved to Ickes in 1959. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, 58. You were Ickes. That's right. I was Ickey-ite, in Ickes. Huh? That's right. I was Ickes. 22nd <laughs> State Street. That's right. I moved into Ickes before they built the expressway. Right. I used to walk. To Chinatown. You know who else was from the Ickies? Uh, mm-hmm. Deval Patrick, yeah. governor of Massachusetts. Yeah. You know what's interesting? Ruben Cannon's also from I'm, I'm currently Ruben making Cannon. a song about the Ickies. Oh, like, really? Yeah. For my new album. We're, I'm working on an album uh, uh-huh. called I Could Get Killed for This. Uh-huh. And one of the songs I'm doing is about uh, gentrification of the projects in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, Cabrini gone, the Ickies gone, they kick my people out them Henry Horner homes. We all <laughs> segregated, but we feel alone. They say, whatever don't kill you and then it keeps going but you know uh, 
gentrification. You know what's deep about that? Okay. It's all law. All, now. all of those <laughs> those uh, housing projects which used to be enemies of each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they tore them down and then they put them all in the same block together. In the same neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. In the same neighborhood, and, and that's part of the. Yeah, the right. Issue. And that's, that's one of the that's one yeah, of the reasons for Chicago's exceptionalism. No, the, the, this yeah. murder exceptionalism. That but yeah. I want to go back to a point that that uh, Floyd made because. On the one hand, we get Beast of the Wild and it gets all these accolades and we have a film like Rosewood that nobody looks at and we refuse to watch it because it's, it deals with the depth of the issues that we face as a people. The deconstruction of the black community has been done over an extended period of time and everything, I think, has an impact on it. And I don't think that we can afford to look at ourselves outside of ourselves because I think that's part of our issue. You know, we sort of look at what our people are doing and we see ourselves in, in a different way. And I'm not suggesting that we don't have to have a number of different types of films because as a filmmaker, I, I think that it's important that we share a number of different types of stories. I just think that we have to also, at the same time, determine who are the vanguards of what we believe, who are the vanguards of our community and our minds. We have lost our African minds. We have to regain them. <laughs> Mm. And we regain can them. Can we regain them, Pamela? I think we can, but but we have to attack it like we were attacked. Mm. We have to attack it in music. We have to attack it in culture. We have to attack it in the way that we dress. We have to at some point recognize the fact that hair is, uh, that you are your hair. Uh. Because the reality is that we are. And the, and the mere fact that we tried to get away from our you know, we have Haitians and Jamaicans running around talking about they Haitians and Jamaicans. That in, in reality, they're just folks that were dropped off early. You got off the boat from Africa about 200, 300 miles before somebody else. We have to connect back to our original selves mm -hmm. and, and our institutions. You know, Oscar Brown asked me one day if I thought that it was by accident that all the wrong, peop wrong people run our institutions. And that is a legitimate question. And we have to drive ourselves to take control of everything from education to religion. We have to relook at the whole structure of how our communities are controlled and take back and take you know, back to the uh, But well, see, my 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 my, mm. my my thing though is we also have to be careful of this antiquated, nostalgized thought of who we are based on what we were. Mm. So so you know, Africans have lost their African minds. You know what I mean? When you mm. have. Africans in Sudan saying that they're Arabs, they don't know who they are. You know, I, I know Africans, I just returned from Europe where, where Africans are calling themselves Britain, where Africans are, are they call themselves yeah. British. So how can we and connect? We, we talk about Tanzania, um, yeah. Zanzibar, they call themselves Persian. But, so but, how can but, we but connect mean, with but people mean, who are connected to themselves? Well, it you means know. that a person like you yes. that writes and has, has an impact on the brains of our children mm -hmm. begins to construct our new reality. Mm -hmm. I'm exactly. not suggesting that we go back to the past and try um, to, to do anything other than recognize what it was and reconstruct a future that our kids can look to. Um, because the only way they're going to feel some value for life is if they have a future that they yes. can depend on. How uh, many of us have actually lived in Africa here B besides me? I've lived there. Okay. I have not. Just visit. Okay, okay. And most young people okay, can't even fathom what okay, Africa looks okay. like. Okay, haven't yeah. lived there. Haven't well, lived I've there. lived there for a month. I yeah, lived yeah. well, I haven't lived there. I, I lived in Tanzania over a year. I traveled. Okay. I traveled from England. I traveled from England to Morocco, then went by truck, crossed Algeria, I went up into Egypt. Okay, you got went bonus, to Sudan. You got bonus, I went and I stayed once I got there, right? But I but I went by land for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. I wasn't looking for my roots, you know, because we got so much Africa here that we don't know about that we no longer recognize it. I don't have mm -hmm. to go there to look, right? Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, when I went back, I went for the experience, right? And when I got there, I went there to make a contribution because uh, Julius Nayeri had had said, that, had said in Tanzania, if you come there as an African American, you could find sanctuary, mm -hmm. you know. Right. And that might have changed by the time I got there due to some things that happened <laughs> before the six pack, before the six pack African Congress. But I was pretty much welcome every place I went, mm -hmm. right? But as an African American. I remember, I remember when I first got into Kenya, and and uh, and and really all all parts of Africa, man. I grew up in. I was born in the fifties in in, in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. I took a bath in a number ten tub. I had a 
galvanized aluminum tubs. Anybody know anything about that? No. Galvanized aluminum tub, right? We had a pump. I drank water from the world. I had to go out and pump. You know, this is what we did. We had an outhouse, right? Okay. When I got to Africa, it's pretty much the same thing. Mm. So I felt right at home <laughs> because I'm from the rural south. Mm-hmm. That's where I was born. That's what That was my orientation to the world, right? Okay. And not only that, I was also oriented to the magical traditions, right? Mm, I had a mm. great grand. I had a grandfather oh, who was some a, people call superstitions. I had a grand. No, we call it two headed doctors. Okay, but dig, dig it. <laughs> um, hold on, man. I want to. I want to continue that narrative, man. But we gotta. We gotta take a break at the top okay, of the hour. Sure. So uh, yeah. we will be back with Floyd Webb, Ryan Fest Smith, and mm-hmm. Paymon Rami. Right after this. Go it's Lee Milwaukee here on the Talk of Chicago 1690. It is 8.06. I have with me in the studio a celebrated assemblance of uh, talent here. Our brother Che Reinfest Smith, brother Paymon Rami, and brother Floyd Webb. It's an incredible uh, aggregation. Um, I couldn't be more pleased. And we have all of this to, available for you folks, the listeners of WVON. It's a magnificent uh, treat for you. So uh, soak it up, please. Now, Floyd, you were saying, um, what were you saying? I was saying that this thing about Africa and regaining our, our African minds. First of all, I don't think we really lost them. I think, the, I think it's laying dormant. I think we don't recognize what it is. Uh, I think that in terms of, you know how they say it takes a community, it takes a village to like raise a mm. child. That's true. What Ryan Fest just described to me about how he how he brought these young how he's <coughs> bringing these these young brothers along. Yeah, we have that's how two, we're supposed two to do. young brothers in the studio who have joined Ryan Fest, and and it's they're a team. Right, they're, they're working on right. some positive things. And he's somebody who's bringing them under his influence in order to so that so that so that there's somebody behind him. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's something that our leadership has failed to do. And you know, they haven't true. groomed anybody, brought anybody behind them because they got the petty chief syndrome where they want to be chief. But man, nobody not, groomed you know? us, uh, Floyd. We, we yeah, just, somebody we, did groom us. Somebody well, did groom we, us. we seized the time. We though. seized the time because we had somebody before us. If it okay, wasn't for right. Melvin Gaynor, if it all wasn't right. for Melvin okay. Gaynor, if it wasn't for Mr. English, if it wasn't for my seven uncles that, that, that I got, if yes, it wasn't sir. for the it was, if it wasn't for the barber at the barber shop who said when I came in the first time, he says, "What's in your hands?" I said, "Nothing." He says, "What's in your pocket?" I said, "Nothing." He said, well, next time you come in here, you have a book in your hand, and you better have my money, right? Ooh. But you always better have a book, right? Mm. So I had, so this is the kind of influence we had living in the hood, right? Okay. right. Is that people were, you know, we were uplifting to one another. You know, you would be scared of people. But, I, I, but, be, I'm, I, but I, you know, I'm harking back to what Ryan Fair said about this, this, this tendency to, to wax yeah. nostalgic about I understand. I understand it. I understand that totally. Because and that still like exists. That but barber still it. exists. But he's That's doing right. it. Right. But, but, but he's doing it. That's what I'm saying. We just don't talk about it. We don't, we really, we accentuate. We live in a, we have a deficit model of who we are. But Floyd, that's right. where it gets back to media, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So, okay, right. it was a shock when Malcolm X was talking about the white man and the media said, put a camera on that Negro. Uh-huh. And when Dr. King was marching, put a camera on that Negro. Mm-hmm. Now the government and the society has gotten hip to the fact that, wait, they can stimulate worldwide change mm-hmm. with, with, with getting those cameras on mm-hmm. that type of message. Mm-hmm. So the cameras went away, and, and especially mm-hmm. in the music industry. Mm-hmm. What we find is that they want what... Uh, the white corporations believe is an authentic black experience. So let's take hip hop. When it started in New York, uh, that was, oh man, look at those, oh, that's authentically black. But now in the West Coast, Colors came out. Uh, uh, Boys in the Hood came out. Mm-hmm. And and you know what? Man, Ice Cube, NWA, Ice, that's an authentic black experience. Mm-hmm. So let's take rap music and our label dollars and go to the authentic hip hop experience, which is gang banging in LA. Then what we found out was Wait, let, Tupac. Let, let, let me just hold, hold up for a minute because yeah. a lot of people say Ryan Fest that it wasn't they weren't seeking authenticity that they were seeking to counteract the positive hip hop that was coming out of the East Coast, Public Enemy. Uh, well, 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 I think that's that's part of the nostalgia. All mm-hmm. the hip hop that was coming out of the East Coast was not positive that's right. because you got Cool G rap, you got Biggie Smalls, <laughs> you got you had gangsters. Now, mm-hmm. I, I I just want to finish the, the even the, KRS One, even KRS One. Mm-hmm. Listen to my nine millimeter go right. bang. Right. So 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 then what you 
you had was we found out Tupac uh, was in artist artisan school and his mother was a revolutionary and Ice Cube was wasn't really from Compton. Ice Cube was raised by middle class parents and you know then this whole thing happened with the murder and Tupac and Biggie. So now what do they do? Let's what's the authentic uh, a black experience down south? You know smoking high in my cup, gold grills, you know all that authentic black shop. experience. Oh wait, now Ti's a family man. We found out Lil John's on the Apprentice and he's a marketing guru under uh, 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 tr Donald Trump. Oh, wait a minute. We need an authentic black experience. Chicago has the number one murder. <laughs> so where are all the artists being signed at? Where's the record industry coming for rap, black, authentic experience? Chicago. And that's how it works. Dig that. But, I like that. But, but you know, even with blues, even if, mm -hmm. even if we go back to blues, right? Mm -hmm. All of our marginal, all of our, all of our music, our culture comes out of marginal music. That's right. A lot of times. Right? And gutter and you go back to blues licks. I don't want my 44 so long. I done made my shoulder sore. Right. That's a that's a that's a uh, 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 that's a uh, Howlin' Wolf lyric. Right. Because Howlin' Wolf, like Howlin' Wolf, all these cats, everybody was everybody was packing. There was like Saturday Night Murders down in Mississippi in the juke joint. You know, this is this is the same thing. You you had the same types of experience. Even back to Jamaica, even back Trinidad, Trinidad, you had the boys, but the uh, Kaiso boys down in the yards, right? Yeah. These dudes, they had Tambu Bamboo, right? They did the same thing hip hop. They they did the same thing in 1910 that hip hop does now. They went, they composed lyrics down in their yards. They had competitions. It was all related to the marginal culture that they came from, mm -hmm. right? And this Tambu uh, Bamboo, this Kaiso, Kaiso became what? Calypso, mm -hmm. right? Out of that experience, out of that West Indian experience, that lyrical experience that we don't know about because we tend not to learn anything about other cultures and and like how black music is essential mm -hmm. and how all of these things that we talk about. Socialized to be provincial. Socialized to be provincial and not global, so we don't know what our own similarities are, right? But when you go back and listen to the names of all these guys from Trinidad, right? Lord and you look at the fact, and look, Sonia, one of Sonia Sin's cousins, Became a big Kaiso because he was because his because his cousin was banished to China for being a revolutionary, right? And he got down there, was raised black, you know, Chinese. But guy but I mean, black. but, so, but, so but you also, know, Calypso. So, and, you're right. I mean, but, I think. I but think you're what right happened to Calypso? But, but what happened to Calypso? It went from being this news wire. It, it went from being this lyrical challenge. It went from being this thing to it turned into this softened sexual. You know, uh, sexual innuendo. It lost its political similar, nature. Similar dynamic it lost its similar. Yeah, it lost mm. its political nature. Okay. It lost the real political community nature. Sky right? and reggae as well. Right. 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 Sky mm. and reggae too. When mm. when you, when you get to it, and you see what the marketing forces do to the music in order to make it more palatable for a mass market. So this is not. You're saying this is not an unusual this dynamic. This is not unusual. Yeah. This is this is a repetition. This is a this is this is a constant Same repetition that happens to our. To, to what happens to our culture from the end of from the end of uh, of uh, from from the uh, end end of slavery on on up until the advent of jazz. Mm. You know, Shay, Shay a little while ago talked about how uh, the industry controls mm -hmm. what movement is made in, in our mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. So they would determine what mm -hmm. values are created and, and what celebrities and stars are created outside of our music. And there's a lot of truth to that. But we still can't ignore our history in this country. And so when you look at the fact that the only way we're going to get a black savior, and I'm going to use that gingerly, is that the media selects that person and puts them in front of us, we have to look back to Marcus Garvey. Here's a guy who didn't have Facebook, didn't have Twitter, didn't have TV, and got 20 million members hmm. to his organization in a, in a relatively short period of time. I think the challenge is that our commitment is not towards the uplifting and saving of our community as much as it is to attempting to be successful in this society. Mm. And at some point, we've got to look back and say, how do we save our children? How do we save our families? And this has been going on for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. You replace Bill Cosby with Tyler Perry shows. Mm. You, re you replace the films where we had heroes with uh, Denzel playing a cocaine addict uh, plane uh, pilot mm -hmm. who did a heck of a job. Flying upside yeah, down. Yeah, I like that yeah. movie. <laughs> he, did, he, did, he did a heck of a job. Yeah. 
I don't. I didn't see the Image Awards. So did it get an Image Award for that character? That's something that the NAACP has to address <coughs> too, when it relates to the fact they ought to change the name to an acting award rather than an Image Award. Because if it's an Image Award, it needs to stand for something mm-hmm. that we can relate. And we've got. And I. I like Scandal. I'm going to say it publicly as much as I hate to say it. I like the show, but look at what we have constructed as this woman who's in charge of it, a womanizer. I'm not a womanizer, but a a person who's having an affair. That's we love her because of what of, of Carrie and what she's how she's pulling it. But when you look at the character and what it represents, uh, we got to. Well, how how, uh, go. Pamela, how 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 assiduous should we be to to kind of what what we would consider kind of the moral qualities of a character? I mean, is that is that such an important thing? I mean, do we have to do we have to exemplify? This 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 um this positive person at, at all times or is, is that what our our imagery our image making should be about? Well, I tell you, I, no. I think that that an artist can create whatever they want to create. Mm-hmm. I think that the parents are responsible for not allowing their children to see the images that are not uh, healthy in the way that they should be bringing their children around. I think that the filmmakers and I, I love Shay and the work that he's doing. The obligation of our filmmakers need to be to create a world that is better for our people, mm-hmm. and it has to be done in a contemporary sense. I mean, we look at Africa, and I, I understand the whole issues of colonialism and the impact of everything that was in Africa being stolen, and the fact that this country is what it is because of slavery, and that's why everybody else wants to get here. You know, if, if Africans had free labor for 300 years, it would be on the top. That's everybody would want to go man. there. Check that. You know, the that's the reality. Mm-hmm. And so. But but we have to help our artists to find a, a real voice that our children can listen to. And it needs to be segregated in a way that we don't take our kids to see movies that are unhealthy. <clears throat> well, but well, they I, have to have movies well, that I help Well, you with. know, I mean, this is how, I, and my son's 14. I don't know if any of you all ever met Solomon, but Solomon is one of the most balanced 14-year-olds. Yeah. And, and I guess the way that I did it as a father, because it wasn't a man, you and I'm bringing rap music in the house that right, got B's right, and H's right, and calling right. women off and all types of right, violence. And, right. But what I also did was I, I started off uh, my child's musical learning by giving him his first iPod with songs that I put on there right. and it was N.W.A. it right. was Ghetto Boys it was right. Public Enemy it was Big right. Daddy Kane it was so my son came up saying I know who Too Short is I like Too Short mm-hmm. but I also like Brand Nubians mm. and and I think that it's part of a right. we, we need not to say positive or negative Media we need to literacy. say balanced diet and, 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 and explain to our children from yeah. that point you know yeah. what this is and the history of it yeah. so I explained to my son how the song F the Police by N.W.A., while it ushered in gangster rap, was also revolutionary in its nature Mm -hmm. to public enemies, uh, you know, talking about Farrakhan. Then that may have been a a cult following Mm -hmm. that was followed by white people, by the way, because black people Mm -hmm. weren't as into public enemy. And we need to be honest that public enemy sold records to white folks. N.W.A. sold records to black folks and then white folks. So so we we have to talk about. Uh, yeah. Another ironic thing about that too, before mm-hmm. and I'll let you get in, yeah. is that uh, m- many of NWA's personnel wound up in the Nation of Islam. Yes, uh, MC mm-hmm. Ren and, and mm-hmm. I. But let's be honest. And also, Jesse Jackson didn't support Public Enemy, and this is exactly why we got NWA. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? So right. we're not honest about how a lot right. of our right. we act like these young people dropped out of an yeah. alien ship right. out of right. nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. We act like these young people and the behaviors that they're exhibiting today came yeah. out of the blue, and we yeah. so shocked. But when we had a chance to support a youth black power movement, we ran away from it. We ran away from it and we had Reverend Calvin Butts steamrolling over MC Light and Big Daddy Kane records that did no good for our people. Cool mode, come on. I mean, having a Twitter, like my my son is 21, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I never prevented him from listening to anything, right? Because it was about teaching him what he was listening to. It was about mm-hmm. making him media literate, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I remember uh, when he showed, when he fell in love with uh, with uh, uh, with, uh, 50 Cent, mm-hmm. okay. right? And uh, he showed me 50 Cent's website. 50 Cent had, I don't know if y'all remember this, 50 Cent had a website where you open it up and he shotgun you in the face, mm-hmm. right? And I said, Jabril, come here. <laughs> he said, now, why do you want to listen to somebody who want to shoot you in the face with a shotgun? I said, let's talk about that. I said, let's let's really get that. I said, that ain't I said that ain't cool. It ain't hip, you know. And uh, and and you won't live, right? Mm-hmm. 
because so this ain't real. I said so. Let's just, so I deconstructed Fifty Cent's character, right? So and and actually he started thinking about it, right? Next thing you know, uh, I mean, like five years later, he has this real eclectic. You no, know, I pick up his stuff. I'm listening to it, and he got some. You know, uh, he had some of everybody on there. He even had here come the judge. You know, going back to the first rap thing, wow. you know, uh, uh, Pygmy Barkham, here comes the judge. Uh-huh. What you know about Pygmy You know, but he had all this stuff on there. But it's in the same way he learned about Steamboat Willie when he learned about animation, right? I'm talking about, well, how do you know about Steamboat Willie? Because he was on Cartoon Network when it first started. They showed all these old cartoons. Mm-hmm. So it's about how we engage our children, mm-hmm. you know, and, 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 and like what how about, we help them understand these But, but see, that's, that, those are... Uh, Engaging parents; those are parents yeah. who want to engage. Right, what right. about what about this vast group of parents who are not really? Well, what's, well, well, what you have with these parents today, though, is you are dealing, and, and, and I'm looking at this historically. Remember when you know uh, uh, Jackie Robinson came along, and then the generation after Jackie Robinson said, "Hey, he's a sellout. Mm-hmm. We need Black Power. He's going mm-hmm. along with the mm-hmm. and, and the children often grow up and say, "We don't like the old way that our parents did things." So now, mm-hmm. what you're dealing with are crap crackhead era parents. I mean, I'm a parent and mm-hmm. I come from the 90s. The people that I grew up with and my mom, those were the crackhead era parents mm-hmm. and you're dealing with the children who yeah. didn't have grandparents who had gr- crackhead parents and the children are uncontrolled. Yeah. Yeah. What's going to happen in a generation or two, I suspect, is that their children are going to grow up and say, we don't want to be like our parents that was ratchet yeah. and running wild and they're going to rebel uh, the, so, so what you're going to see? Republicans. Well, yeah, well, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps, I, perhaps. perhaps. I, I, I do think that I'm that serious. Republicans are I'm, Black I'm, American I'm, values. I'm serious. You, you take away the racism of Republicans. Republican. There you go. And there and you, and, go. And you got it. us. That's you got it. the nation of Islam. That's it. Really? Yeah. Yeah. That's but it. you know, but you know, but what what Ryan Fitz is talking about, what Jay is talking about, is this natural, mm-hmm. uh, the, the pendulum swing. Right. will happen. Right. From one side to the other, and that is an organic process. And the Really, no matter what we do, right. like for example, in the eighties, well, well, in the in the in the nineties, from about ninety four on, crime in our communities, murder began to drop dramatically, mm-hmm. and nobody really knew why. Really, uh, some people would say it was the, it was the the Million Man March mm-hmm. that, that made uh, delayed effect of the Million Man March because it began to drop dramatically, um, and and people didn't know why, mm-hmm. and and then it now it's coming back up again. Mm-hmm. But in, remember, seventy four was almost a thousand mm-hmm. and then it went down and then in the 90s it came up again mm-hmm. so maybe it is this mm-hmm. evolutionary well, you know, I, I don't think it's organic mm-hmm. I don't think it's organic at all I, I mm-hmm. think it has to do with our ability to keep constructing organizations and people that provide us for what we ought to be and I think it has a great deal to do with it Ramfest talked about um, apathy and, it, and it's, it's obvious that two gentlemen here sitting with us uh, weren't apathetic about their children and their learning. At some point, you have to determine what is it that you see when you look out of the window? And what is it that our children are taught to see? Do they see the dirt, the grime, the crackhead on the corner? Or do they see the trees and the sun and the beautiful sky? Who constructs that in their minds that allows them to have an image of what is to become? And so I don't think it's by accident. I think it's, you know, I personally had a number of mentors, men that took me under their wing when I was really, really young, from Oscar Brown Jr. to Bobby Wright to Anderson Thompson, and I can name at least 12 other men that stood there and said, I see promise in you, young man. I'm going to invest in helping you to do what you want to do. And I think the more that we do that, the mere fact that Ryan Fest didn't walk in here by himself is an image of what we have to take on as a people. And each one of you, each, every one of us has to step back and say, how do we help our young folks? Leadership is developed, I think, sometimes as a result of opportunity, but also it is inherent in the person. We can see that leadership in our children. They might become gang leaders. They might become the best crack dealer on the corner. But you see the, the leadership in them. So how do we see the leadership in these young kids? And instead of beating how do we it out of them, mm-hmm. how do we nurture it? How do we nurture it? Yes. yes. You, you know, you know I, I, I will say that, you know, I was nurtured and mentored by Salim Muwakil, by uh, Dr. Cordell West, by Timuel Black, mm-hmm. by even yeah. as a young person. 
I lived across the street from Mosque Marion all my life and never knew. I, I didn't have a father. My mother was on drugs, on, on crack. I learned how to treat women from her bad boyfriends, right? So, so you know, I, I got, I still got issues. So, you know, uh, and I'm happily married. So, you know, um, but, but my thing is, I would see the Muslim men at Mas Marian and didn't know who they were, didn't know what they did. They dressed weird. They mm-hmm. stood up straight. They walked mm-hmm. a certain way. Mm-hmm. And as a 12-year-old, mm-hmm. I asked my auntie. I lived in a house full of women. I asked my auntie. I said, who are those guys? She said, don't mess with them. Them the Muslims. Mm-hmm. And the, But they serious, and they'll kill you. <laughs> don't mess with them Muslims. Mm-hmm. But she didn't tell me don't mess with them GDs. Right. She didn't tell me don't right. mess with them right. vice lords up the right. block. Right. Right. You know. And so I, growing up, um when I when I joined uh the, the 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 GD Nation, you know what I'm saying? I came from Jeffrey Manor and when I joined the GD Nation because that was my condition of that neighborhood, uh and I had a a, a friend who was a well, vice. Why, why did you you join it? Because it was just what you had to do in your neighborhood. It was what I had to do in my neighborhood. I had to take the bus from South Shore uh, to Jeffrey Manor, which I had to pass CVS and all the uh, the the, uh, the, uh, the four corner hustlers would jump on the bus, and I needed to be a part of something. Yes, to protect myself, right? Mm-hmm. So when I when I joined it as a as a youth, uh, uh, I had a I made a friend who was a vice lord, and this vice lord friend said, "Hey, you ever heard Farrakhan speak?" I said, "Who is that?" He said, "At the mosque that your aunt had lived across the street from." <laughs> I said, "Man," so I went and I listened to the the minister speak, and it sounded like he was talking to me, mm. and he was talking about gangs and violence and what mm. need to happen in the hood. And that's when I dropped the whole, I, I stopped being scared of the neighborhood, the conditioning, and I said, I'm going to move toward this. Now, I'm not a member of the Nation of Islam today, but that was the beginning of my journey. And, and, you know, and, and so when we talk about nurturing, I have been mentored by, by people I've never even met. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I was mentored when I heard, Harold, when, when I began to run for office. You, you know what began that run? I heard a quote. From Harold Washington, they said that political power is something that has to be taken. You can't wait for it to be given. Uh-huh. And that's when I said, you know what? Forget Mayor Daly. Forget the <laughs> preachers in the neighborhood. Forget I'm going to take some political power. And, and so that's I right. think when we talk about nurturing, this is, okay, forget our responsibility. The responsibility of the young people is to be nurtured by everything they see around them mm-hmm. and not just mm-hmm. so so I took the GDs I took what I saw from Farrakhan I took what I heard from Hill Washington and I started to put this together into what my experience and who I should be as a man and I think young people have a responsibility to tell truth about their own situation mm. okay yeah Floyd yeah. yeah no I I totally agree because you know coming from an activist background you know, starting the Quinn Chapel during the time of Martin Luther, when Martin, when Martin Luther King came to Chicago when I was living in the Ickes, King was based at Quinn Chapel for a, a minute. Uh, for those first marches, the ones that were engaged part park where he had the brick, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, you know, and some of us went along, you know, we snuck out. My mom didn't want us involved in none of that, and it was a it was the beginning of something. But but we were surrounded by people, you know, as young people. It was young people involved in the movement. You know, look at look at like Stokely and them. And Stokely and them, all these cats were young cats, man. That's they were right. they were uh-huh. young. You know, all the cats around Dr. King were young people. You know, these were not old men we were talking about. Dr. King was only thirty. That's what I'm saying, man. He you was, know, we he seized was thirty. You we know, seized. Yeah. We seized the opportunity. But, yeah. we, we didn't wait for somebody to hand it right. down to us. Because mm-hmm. we saw people not too far from where we were. I mean, man, Stokely was incredible, man. Mm-hmm. I'm, look, I'm living in Georgia, right? I'm living in Georgia. I'm in ROTC. My old man back from Vietnam. I'm in ROTC watching TV one night. And Stokely, not Stokely, Rap Brown came on mm-hmm. TV. And, and they taking him to jail. Rap Brown calling them all kind of white, they, blue-eyed apes and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and we sitting there, man. And, and, and like, and I'm already studying about Ho Chi Minh, man, going like, oh, I'm kind of like like this dude, right? But I'm supposed to be getting ready to do the West Point thing and all this stuff. And it's like, you, you know, we we had the ability, I think, you know, based on, you know, what, what, once again, based on the fact that I had I had parents, I had extended family, I had people around me who were supportive and who were also challenging, constantly challenging me to be all that I could be, you know, without well, being in the Army and all that kind of shit. Well, see, but I, was, I, I ran into you, I ran into you, uh, when I was in the nation, and so yeah. you you had to be a, 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 um, an adventurous kind of brother 
to want to work for Muhammad Speaks at that time. <laughs> but but I used to work for the paper though, because mm-hmm. I used we used to go me and my kid me and my homies. Okay, mm. okay. Uh, me me and, and my homies. We lived on 23rd and State Street, and the press was where? It was on 24th and Federal, mm-hmm. right? So we used to walk up there, and we would do whatever. You know, we, we had hustles, man. From the time I was like like six years old, we had a, you know, I had a job. I needed comic books, and my mom wasn't buying them. So we had to have a hustle that was legit, you know, because I couldn't have the police bringing me home. Mm-hmm. So we used to go work in Chinatown, cleaning out nasty garbage cans. We used to go over to Muhammad Speaks, and we would help clean up after they put the papers and all the paper out all mm-hmm. over the dock. We would we would do all, all of all all of that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. So I was okay. around. One of my friends told me told me we used to see Malcolm all the time, but I never remembered that, right? Because Malcolm was the uh, ed- editor of the paper at that time. But like he said, he was always over there. I said. But he lived in New York. He says, "Yeah, but when he was when he was here, he was there." You know, Salim. Yeah, we, so, yeah. you know, I think we have uh, short-term mm-hmm. historical memory lapses, mm-hmm. or we have short-term historical memory, and so as a result of that, we only we only remember those things that are really really close. We have a mobile museum uh, at the Dusable, and there's a picture of Harold Washington. Uh, on this mobile museum. And when young people go into the mobile museum, they either think it is um, George Washington Carver or they think it is Frederick Douglass. Wow. Because they have not been taught that history. Mm-hmm. Speaking of speaking of Ace Rap Brown, I had the opportunity to speak on a program with him in New York when I was, I think, 18 and 19. Mm. And Rap told a story. Uh, he said it was called Father and Son. And the, and the son was talking to his father. He said, Daddy, you tell me that the lion is the king of the jungle. Yet in every book I read, the man always kills the lion. He said, Daddy, why is that so? So the father turns around to the boy and says, until the lion learns to write, the story will always end the same. Mm-hmm. And I remember hearing Rap say that, and it was, it was burned into my memory. And I took on personally the responsibility for constantly working on us telling our own stories. Mm-hmm. Because nobody's really, else, really gonna tell us for it. And it's gotta be, and, and something that I try to say to young people, and, and this is something that I say to artists in general, the art that you create will be around much longer than you will. So in 200 years, your great-great-grandchildren are going to open up a time capsule, and they're going to find your record or your book or your film. Mm. Do you still write that, that song? You, you, oh, man, that, that's mm. powerful. But you know what's interesting? I, I, something that we haven't discussed and we haven't looked at. I had a conversation with Quincy Jones. Quincy Jones said, you know why you why young people will never make the music that we made when we came up? I said, why not? He said, because you all just don't have the same drugs. And I think, and I think, I mean, let's be real, right? For real. So, so he For said, real. you all don't have the same drug. <laughs> and I knew exactly. He said, and I went and I listened to Sensuality Part 1 and 2 by the Ozzy Brothers. And I said, well, what was they on? And I listened, and I, and I, and I listened to some Al Green records and said, what was he on? And, you know, and, and, and so, and so, you know, so what, what, but he said, but what you can do is sample us <laughs> and pay us. And, and you can get, he said, that's why I think sampling is necessary because you'll never have the drugs to recreate. What we did, I like that. And, and so, and so I, I, it was so wow. profound to me. It is profound. But but when you li- when you think about the drugs that young people are taking now, that are in a pill, that have everything combined in it, that is all synthetic, right? I'm not promoting drugs, but what I what I'm trying to convey is that the drugs that we're taking now have us doing things that we've never done, like th- this mass fat fat. People don't talk about the drug component. That yes, you're in ecstasy when you take it, but the after effect of the drug is ecstasy a very big. Is that very big among young? Well, right now it's Molly. You know what I mean, Molly, which is a advanced form of ecstasy. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying, which comes in a pill and it gives you that 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 intense uh, uh, feeling to the touch. And ecstasy was supposed to be an empathetic drug. I mean, that makes you more empathetic toward others rather than violent. No, the thing is the after effect when you're on it. You feel this way. Mm-hmm. When you come down off of it, the feelings of paranoia, mm-hmm. frustration, you know, and then and, and, and if something is happening, once that high drops, your reaction 
may be a reaction that okay. the ecstasy, you know what I mean? Got you. So, so you know, a lot of times the, in, 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 in our communities, you don't know what's in the pill. That's right. So they're mixing up all types of stuff that isn't truly ecstasy mm-hmm. in these pills. We are still being experimented on. And, you know, when you look at Project Ultra and all this mm. stuff, this stuff is still happening in our communities. And, and, and that's a comp- also another component that I'm noticing with young people is coddling by mothers. Right. So, you know, when when uh, I know children that are from fair, very good homes, mother and father, and we don't we, we talk about the children that are from single parent homes and it's hard. But there are a lot of young people that are uh, don't have accountability or responsibility. They don't have to empty the trash. They don't have to pay a bill. Mm. When I got a job and I made $100 a week, my mother made me give her $35 out of every $100 check. So I learned how to pay bills at that point in eighth grade, right? Young people are shielded from the hard work. The world is so hard that what we have is parents to shield their young people from it. And you can cripple and destroy your child. Uh, and, and a lot of our young people are crippled and destroyed mm. by their grandmamas. Mm. <laughs> you know, I, you know I, I so agree with the whole issue of uh, drugs being having an impact on our society today. And I had no intention on missing this, but right before Christmas, uh, my granddaughter uh, was murdered in Las wow. Vegas. I'm sorry. Damn. And, uh, Damn, and I'm not going to go into the you. specific details of the case, but I will hmm. say she was 10 that she was stabbed 40 times. Mm. Now, the only reason I'm really mentioning this is because I was wondering about 40. Mm. I'm going, so why not 38? You know, like why 40? And so I Googled 40 times. And then I get a list of of people that have been stabbed 40 times. Mm. And And then there's an article that says on the internet, how many times does it take to stab somebody if you go kill them. So then the article starts with one good sw- um, stab in the right place will kill the person. But 40 times will definitely kill them. So I'm saying, okay, so then there was a list of people that had been stabbed 40 times. So I'm going down the list and going, okay, so did the people see the article? Were they counting? while it was going on, and I'm not trying to bring humor to it because it you know, just impacted our family recently. But I couldn't understand 40, and I still don't understand it today. And I do think that if you look at a lot of these people that are, are doing these hideous crimes, mm-hmm. and, you, and, and, and you look at what Shay just talked about, either the drugs that they've been on or the drugs that they are now off, I think that we will see some relationship. Correlation. And correlation but we have to go beyond the drugs to mm. also talk about diet. Talk about mm. these salt laden mm. sugar diets that people drugs. Well, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah right. but, but but I mean, like, but people aren't seeing that. Yeah. You know, mm. like pork, more people die from more more people die from love of a pork chop than they do drugs. Mm. Okay, yeah, but All that right. does. But, well, hold but, on, hold but, on, hold but, on. But let we, me finish. But we, let me, we've let been let on let me, those drugs for a long let me, time. Let me, let me, let me finish. Yeah, that's let me, true. Let me, let me finish. But no, something has changed. No, something. It's a combination of factors. There's a holistic thing in the society, right? These factors that are all converging. Right, that are putting us in a situation that is worse than 150 years ago. That we're dying in numbers worse than we did 150 years ago. You know you what mean I mean? Diet related uh, 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 ailments? No, I'm just no. I'm talking about the violence oh, okay. as a uh, whole. Mm-hmm. But the behavioral, but, it, but it's directly but, related but the to slavery. The 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 uh, the, uh, the uh, nutritional, the uh, new nutritional, the way that we get our nutrition mm-hmm. has something to do with our behavior. I so okay. so what, what, I, what I was okay. just saying so, is so that it's directly, is saying. it's directly related to slavery. Let me mm-hmm. see why I said that. When you look at at the West Indies and and um, mm-hmm. uh, Floyd talked about that a few minutes ago, the West Indies was built around sugarcane. Mm-hmm. Right. That's why they imported the Africans. They built this whole sugar <coughs> industry. Prior to slavery, sugar was something that only rich people had. You know, mm-hmm. poor people didn't have it. Right. Mm-hmm. So then now they got the slave. They got this research resource of sugar. Then they started feeding the sugar to poor people. And so the whole diabetes thing traces all the way back to the transatlantic slave mm-hmm. trade, to the sugar, to the sugar cane, and now it is wrapped in our communities. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's a, Mm. That's true. <laughs> but Paymo, you know, yeah. you, you mentioned something else I want to explore mm. a little bit um, about the imagery and, and what you, you said that um, you, you were struck that you, you, you took it kind of as your mission 
to 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 uh, to deal with that with that issue. Now you spent a lot you spent a lot of time in Hollywood and uh, in, in in the mainstream use and the mainstream uh, film making industry. How how difficult is it to um, to, to to keep you know to to act out um, some sort of positive imagery from from all of that uh, commercial morass that you find in Hollywood. It's it's difficult. Let me start with the fact that I was the first African American casting black African American cast director in Chicago, mm -hmm. and so I worked on Blues Brothers, Mahogany, uh, Uptown Saturday Night, Three Tough Guys, um, Spoke to Set by the Door, and fourteen other feature films. Mm. Um, when I quit the industry here, it was because they had offered me to do Tarzan, and they also wanted me to find Little Jinx for the remake of The Little Rascals. Mm. I realized while I was here that every time I got a, a script, that if something wasn't wrong with it, they wouldn't be producing it. It had to be something inherently wrong with the story <laughs> for them to have purchased it and want to do it. We are going in Hollywood to young white folks that are in charge of this industry or black people that have been put in a position that have been told that this project that you have to produce has to be considered mainstream. Mm -hmm. Mainstream meaning that white people and, and Hispanics <coughs> and blacks and everybody got to be able to want to go and see it. And because you're sitting with, with some folks that have no interest in telling our story, and they shouldn't have. If a white person brought me Shirley Temple's story as a black producer, I'd say, yeah, I'll do it, but I'm telling it through the eyes of Bojangles. <laughs> that's what I would do. And that's what they do with a lot of the stories that we take that's out to right. them. Right. And those black folks that are hired in Hollywood are still trying to... I was going to ask you this question earlier, Ryan Fess. I was going to say, so why do you write? You know, a lot of, a lot of times, someone told me that, and I'm, it's a famous person, so I won't mention his name, but he had, he had created... A, a film that he produced because he said that's the kind of movie that white people give Academy Awards to. Mm. When when you look at the role that Halle Berry did or when you look at movie uh, films like Precious and some of those other films, mm -hmm. they are the kind of films that Hollywood says, yeah, well, they, it's black enough for me, so yeah, let's just, <laughs> just, just make that one because people will want to go see it and we will see the vile side of this. You didn't story. like Precious? Mm. Man, I had so many uh, problems with Precious that we could be talking about that for another six days. Boy, did and, you like Precious? And did I like Precious? Mm, you know, I didn't like the book. So when what about I, the, I didn't movie? Like the book? The, the movie. Uh, it's Hollywood. I mean, come on. Yeah, I, mean, I didn't like Precious either. Years, yeah. This is a hundred years, man. We a hundred years later, we're having the same conversations we had at the dawn at the beginning as black people. We're having the same conversation we had mm -hmm. about expecting somebody else to tell our story. But you know what, right? Floyd, that's the, and, same, and, that's the same thing people but, say with lynching. But, they say, but, oh, that's just no, white no, people. No, 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 no. This is not the same thing because what, <laughs> yes. we, because what we managed to do was we built an industry out of that, out of that reaction. We built an industry, right? <laughs> up and down State Street, you know, up and down State Street from 22nd and State Street and on up to 35th. There was like 30 theaters right there. Black cinema, black cinema was born in Chicago in 1910 on 31st and State Street. Well, so, and you right? know what happened? Sidney like, Poitier. No, that, that, Sidney Poitier. No, that's and not it, what happened. It, 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 goes, it, it goes to that's the same. It goes that's to the same complex. It goes to the same point about Jackie Robinson. It's an oversimplification. One of what black happened. person gets the no, job and we lose it. No, 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 no. It's an oversimplification. What it is is we didn't have institutions that were focused on culture as a weapon. It wasn't focused on the fact that we're engaged in intellectual warfare in this country. And if we're not engaged in intellectual warfare, we're always going to be victims. Right? So Oscar That's Michelle, what the problem is. We should have followed Oscar Michelle's... Uh, not only Oscar Michelle, George Alexander, mm -hmm. uh, 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 um, uh, George, George Alexander, Spence, Spencer Williams. Spencer Williams. Um, Andy. <laughs> yes, right. uh -huh. yes, but Andy was well, a know, slick producer. Mm. But, but, but I mean, this, this is this is a whole thing. We're engaged in intellectual warfare in this country, right? When, when you look at okay, like, let's take the various communities in this country, right? I got a book I'm reading right now on the Yiddish film industry. Mm. You know, did you know that there was like like a whole Yiddish film industry thing going I, I on? I thought that was Hollywood around, around the world. <laughs> yeah, well, no, well, this is the Yiddish. Okay. You know, that's a little bit too extreme right, because right, Hollywood is really about creating the American dream. Yes, that's sir. what America. That, that's what Hollywood does. Right. I, I mean, it, you know, um, uh, there is a book called How the Jews Invented Hollywood. That's right. 
you know, uh, I suggest empire people, of our I, own. Uh, an empire of our own, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But there's also another book about how America set itself up, self up to dominate the global film industry, right? Mm -hmm. To in, in, in order to perpetuate American values, right? And part of those American values tended to be racism. Right. You know, racism and jazz. You know what I mean? So, so they wanted, you know, so they wanted to have their cake and eat it too, <laughs> right? But we have resisted. I mean, I've never worked on. I, I have really worked on, on on Hollywood films because when I was coming up, I, I was coming up right behind. Uh, well, you worked on Daughters of the Dust, right? Yeah, but that's not a Hollywood film. No, it wasn't. Yeah, yeah, no. I came up right behind uh, Melvin Van Peebles. Mm -hmm. When he oh. made his film in France, Story of a Three-Day Pass, mm -hmm. uh, Story of a, of a Three-Day Pass, La Permission, which was the French entry to the San Francisco Film Festival, Melvin shows up at the airport, and they got a sign saying, Mr. Van Peebles, you know, I thought he was Dutch too. But then white folks said, you ain't Melvin Van Peebles. <laughs> and they, they, they thought it was driving. But he brought this incredible film over. The next film he made was a Hollywood film called Watermelon Man, mm -hmm. right? Godfrey Which, Cambridge. Yeah, with, with uh, God, God, uh, Godfrey Cambridge. But, <laughs> but this is who I came up under. I also came behind a brother in Chicago who made a film called The Cry of Jazz. Mm -hmm. This is really the first. This is really the first kind of revolutionary black film That's a great that film. does something that you know it takes jazz and it examines the whole nature of jazz. It's sunrise in this movie. Have right? you seen that film? No, I haven't. Have Have you seen it, Ryan Fisher? You should see it because it's, it's big, a great because movie. it's really applicable. What is the name of it? It's called The Cry of Jazz. Okay. By a guy named Edward Blanton. Right. He was mm -hmm. going to the University of Chicago. So it's like a twenty minute film. When the film came out in nineteen fifty nine, the fall, uh, it was reviewed in in Film Quarterly. Uh, in the uh, and film quarterly said the first the first sentence was the first anti-white film has been made. Mm. That's how bad this thing was, right? And uh, these people were under investigation by the House on American Activities. All the white folks who was in it was under investigation. It's incredible, right? But see, these are the things that I was coming up because because when I decided to get involved with film, I started out as a photographer, but I always wanted to be a, a filmmaker. But I didn't know any filmmakers. I just knew photographers, right? I got to filmmaking late, you know. But like. When I got into it, I started to investigate this stuff, right, and try to, and like having traveled, because during that time I was traveling, every, everybody I met, it's, 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 it's funny, everybody that I was involved with in politics, you know, when I got down to Tanzania, hanging out with Um Kanto Wasizwe down on the beaches in Tanzania, doing martial arts, because these are all young men, 16, 17 years old, getting ready to go to war, going off to China, going off to Russia, so that they could go back and fight against apartheid, right? So I come back from this experience, man, and it's like, I found out that a lot of these guys have all become filmmakers, right? But, but see, this, you know, this is the so, thing yeah. about that. You, you, mm -hmm. You're talking about mm -hmm. uh, people that you know that have built institutions for you to come up through and in. Right. The, the, the problem we have today we is that young, no, we have them. Mm -hmm. Young people don't believe in them. Mm -hmm. so, so when I look at Spike Lee, right, mm -hmm. what I see is a person that for all of the criticism he'll give Tarantino, who young people love and respect, mm -hmm. his character's are just as outrageous, if not even more outrageous, than Tarantino's character. Mm -hmm. Red Hook Summer was red hot trash. That was a you, you know what I'm saying? And, 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 and so, you know, when we when, when I look at that character of the preacher and red hot trash, which I'll call it, you know, that that was more... You've seen it, though. Most people have never you know what I mean? seen it. Yeah, but that, and I look at that little girl who didn't represent little girls in the neighborhood I come from. You, you, you know, it was strange to me how Spike Lee could then criticize Tarantino Absolutely. for slavery from the imagination of a white man. When so, so when, when I look at Jungle Fever, you know, black women may not like when they see an interracial couple, a black man and a white woman, but they ain't cussing them out in restaurants, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, Spike Lee, school days, totally unrealistic. Mm -hmm. So so when we, I think, you know, when young people look at the, the institutions of Spike Lee and Tyler Perry, that we can read BS when we see it. Yeah. And so young people say, Say, stop hating, Spike. Stop yeah. hating on Tarantino. We yeah. don't believe in you because yeah. our institutions are not giving us a genuine, authentic experience, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, but the problem is that those of us who can have a genuine, authentic experience 
are being controlled by corporate entities, right? So, you know, I, I used to look at OWN, Oprah Winfrey's network, mm. right? She did, she didn't have as many people watching it, but she had more quality product right. before Tyler Perry entered it, and now everything is sexual. Now, I still look at OWN. I, I like I, I like the, the network. It has good shows. Mm. Uh, I love Ayala Vincent's show. However, the when Tyler Perry entered, you can see the change, and it, now it becomes something that although we may like you may be entertained by we will not fall into that institution mm, mm. Um, we don't young people we do not believe in the institutions that we have available do we really have institutions I mean like uh, like I go over to yeah, better boys, you know I go with better boys foundation right better boys foundation got a little film class uh, uh, better, better boys foundation has a film film class right and out of that film class there's a young brother that, well I should say well brother about my age uh uh, who is who started the film class? Billy Brooks, mm -hmm. and uh, Billy is getting these kids like four year rides to college out of this institution. You know, out of out of this place, which used to be the place where they did the Breakfast for Children's program, where Lamont Zeno Theater came from, for where where one of the very first. Big hit place, the Black Fairy came out of. You you remember the Black Fairy? I you know produced yeah, it and yeah, directed I, it. I, I know, I know, I know. You remember the Black Fairy? You, you know, like. Um, we haven't had the opportunity because I don't think we've really got the progressive institutions to create this kind of work that we need to see, right? Uh, I think that we, uh, I think that we have tended not to have the will to do this, you know, because um, like, will we, not, not just wherewithal, not just the wherewithal. Well, I think. Yeah, that's well, what I'm under the well, will. Well, I think, I think uh, I'm, I'm gonna have to be cruel and say we ain't had the will to do it because we would have done it. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? We would have done it. You know, because we've had too much. You know, we, you know, among the nations of the world, African American community is, is, is what probably number fifty or something like that. You know, in in terms of our collective wealth. When you go around, doing, when you go to other places, uh, and uh, you, both you and Ryan Fess are, are globe travelers. When, mm -hmm. when you go to these other places in the world, how do people tend to look at African Americans? Well, how do they be gone? It, it, it's interesting, man, because when I first went abroad, <coughs> it's funny. When I when I first went abroad, I mean, you know, I played flute. You know, I was I was I was playing music, and and like there was a jazz milieu that still existed. Mm -hmm. Like hip hop was rising, right? So between the time I got there in 1974 to about 1982, I remember, never, I'll never forget, I'm walking down the street one day in Brixton, and I go by the police station, and there's a sticker on a post box, and it's this brother, he looks like a lolly, right? He looks like a lolly, the big round face, and, and you know, and, and big lips. It looks like something out of a, uh, out of an old, like one of those old, like uh, black ads, one of those mm -hmm. black toothpaste ads. Mm -hmm. And I look and I walk Darky. up to it and it says, Biggie Smalls. And I'm like, that's weird, right? I, suddenly, it's like, like now, I know about hip hop because I've been listening to hip hop for a long time because I listen to reggae, right? Mm -hmm. And I listen to the toaster. So I was listening to like I Roy, U Roy, and all these cats, mm -hmm. man. So I was listening to the whole evolution of hip hop coming out of Brooklyn and these places. So I'm, I start to see all these different images, and hip hop starts to actually take over, right? To the, to the, to the point when I'm walking down Oxford Street in London, you, you got cats. You know, they, they but I mean, right now, how how how? Well, you know, they, but, but, but right, see, right, my, now, right, right, right now. Let me. I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm gonna just just uh, just mm. Now it's changed again, though, because it goes into the hip hop thing. The brother with the two guns, you know, standing in the window, you know, ceramic figure of, of the uh, uh, closing shot. Now it's to Obama with the suits. Mm. You know what I mean? It's gone through in the 30 years that I've been traveling. It's gone through three permutations. It comes out of the jazz age mm -hmm. in the 1960s into hip hop and now it's come into you know now it's about the the uh, business negro right mm. it's the it's about uh, but but then a lot of hip hop cats are, cats are wearing suits okay. you know what i mean so like it all fits in i think it, i think it depends on where you are right yeah. so if you're in europe mm -hmm. sure yes you know mm -hmm. uh kanye's living in europe and mm -hmm. he's bringing the whole jay-z thing and they're wearing mm -hmm. the suits mm -hmm. and the business mm -hmm. and let's get rich and the hip-hop is turning more pop right mm -hmm. but if you go to africa mm -hmm. you got a whole mm -hmm. nother thing going mm -hmm. on with hip-hop so right. they're they're in the state where, where when you go to these countries you realize they're at least five to, to seven years behind mm -hmm. where we are in america now Which so so 
know what because you because before they mm-hmm. got to that period where, where, where they were five years behind, they were actually moving forward. Yes. It's because bongo flavor in Tanzania and in Kenya, okay, bongo flavor in Tanzania especially, bongo flavor was coming out of the out of the Swahili poetry mm-hmm. tra- tradition, which was pretty much like the Kaiso tradition. Out of, out of, it's an African tra- tradition. It's a the oral tradition which talks about life, which talks about the beauty of life, which talks mm-hmm. about the conditions of life, right? So out of that, it comes up, and then in like 19, what, what was it, 1997, you get your first hip-hop killing in Tanzania, yeah. mm-hmm. right? But you got five years before that happens, right? It's only when it becomes a big money thing, right? When it becomes a big money thing and it, and it gets popular, then the American influence yes. comes in. It comes out of Kenya, yes. down into Tanzania. Now you got everybody trying to be like And, and that's was, what yeah. you find, the, yeah. the, the influence of the money and mm-hmm. the per projection of wealth that rappers give so mm-hmm. it has a different effect on mm-hmm. Africans mm-hmm. so what you find in Africa is you have Tupac gangs you have 50 mm-hmm. gangs named mm-hmm. after rappers mm-hmm. you know what I mean mm-hmm. so, so so what you find is and, they're, and they're, flo- <laughs> they're, they're flossing so I just spoke with uh, one of my Nigerian uh, friends who is a, a big singer over there and he says you know he says, I don't understand why they don't want, our youth don't want to do African music anymore. Mm. While we traded in drums that we were doing for tens of thousands of years, for millions of years, for the new synthetic drum. Mm. You know, like, so, so what you find is that mm. the, and it, it's in the best interest of mm. Jimmy Iovine and Interscope Records not to sell records from Chief Keef, but to have influence across the world to destroy the morale of music and the morale of youth mm. through, through uh, destroying the thing that actually gives us power, which is our rhythm and our melody. Most you know certainly. what I mean? So so the destruction of our rhythm and our melody and the projection of 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 who we are that because what what's actually happening with rap in Chicago is black face is being done through black people from the corporate interest. When I got signed by Clive Davis to Universal to, to J Records, I was in a marketing meeting and we were talking about the song that we were going to go to the radio with. And uh, one of the white people said, and it's black people, white people in the, in the, in the meeting, they said, Ryan Fest, they said, um, you got to make something that niggas want to hear. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? They said, you know, a little more ignorant. You're being too smart. Mm. <laughs> Make, you know what niggas want to hear. Dumb it down. And, and, and so, no, they didn't even say dumb it. I could take dumb it down. Mm-hmm. But but what what shocked me was you know what niggas want to hear. Wow. Yeah. And so yeah. and so yeah. you know yeah. and, and, and and saying that I knew. Right. right. And and yeah. I don't. Why should they have to tell me what niggas? Mm. But and and, they, yeah. and so what they did at that point was try to put their black face yeah. on me. But imagine if. I mean, I got my record deal. I was 27, 28, right? But imagine if I was 16, 17. Why does the military take young people who are 18, 19? Because they can break them down and build them up into killers, right? So why in rap music, when you reach 30 years old, you are old. When you reach 30 years old and and black urban music today, you are are no longer because we cannot control. And and, and so then I go back and I look at my Teddy. Pentagrass records and my Curtis Mayfield records and my Nina Simone and I say these look like grown people. <laughs> these look like adults. These boy Teddy Teddy Pentagrass said it, it look in my eyes and it's easy to see why a great big man like me can be crying, you know, you, crying, crying. You look a little bit, look a little bit like Teddy Pentagrass. You, you know, hey. You know. So, so 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 my thing is that what has happened in black music is that the adult has been taken out mm. and the the child has been replaced with the child and no artist uh yeah. direction or what are they what did uh Barry Gordy used to do uh what do they call it artist development. development you know what I mean so they say it, it's cheaper if Lupe sells more records than Chief Keef which he does mm-hmm. why are they not selling uh, signing more Lupes and why are they signing more Chief Keefs because Chief Keef can make 12 videos in his room, no development, and and it costs no money. He get the beats off the internet, and Lupe is an artist, and he's an adult. Yeah, and he has, I, you I know. hope we don't overlook the, uh, the pay, pay, I, what I want. I want to ask you. We, we, we got to go to a break, but I wanted you to uh, focus a little bit more on. You were talking about we need to 
find our African mind. Okay. And, and, and uh, Ryan Fest was saying that maybe our African mind is uh, is wandering around somewhere that, that we have to, you know, we can't even find it in Africa. Um, so I want to, I want to get into that a little bit more. Of, well, you know, you can start it. You can start it now. We got a little bit of time before we hit the top of that. Well, my, my first response is that that there's some things that are inherent in our DNA that we just sort of find, mm -hmm. and we're the only people that have constantly created new things, and so it has always been uh, developed and moved forward. When you look at the impact of our music, our music has been a representation of where we were in time. It has been a direct reflection of us as a people. So when we were going through slavery. We were dealing with spiritual and, and music that was spiritual. As we began to come out of slavery, we developed the blues because we were the blues people. When we began to find more freedom, we, we began to deal with more jazz. Uh, but today, colonialism or the new colonialism is reflected in what we create here, and that is then imparted overseas. I was in the um, I was up in the rainforest in Trinidad mm. and saw this young sister sagging and walking with her white feet <laughs> on. That, that's a good place to, to put a, to put a, a dash in it. We're gonna come right back to that when we come back <laughs> cool. from the top of the hour. Mm, appreciate you. Nine oh six. Salim Wakio here. With me, our Paymon Rami, Che Ryan Smith. Uh, che Rhyme Fest Smith <laughs> woo, there we go. and Floyd Webb. Um, and we're having a spirited conversation here. And, and I want to get you in on it. I, you know, I, I have to remember that we have some callers <laughs> we right. want to talk to. Right. Well, I got all this wisdom here. It's hard to, it's hard to, to turn that off. And, yeah, it's um, hard to turn off that cold tray, man. Right? Yeah, it is. It is <laughs> um, and, and Paymon, you, you were saying about, about the African mind thing. I want to get keep, about the drooping, that. the drooping pads. Yeah, I was just talking about how in. Uh, in Trinidad, there was a young lady that was walking down the hill and very well influenced by uh, the music that we have here. In Trinidad, they can't have their own TV shows, not because they, they don't have the capacity to produce them, but because they can buy stuff from the United States for a very small amount. So if you can rent or lease a Tyler Perry series for $300, then why give a local producer you know, 5,000, 10,000 to produce something. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things that they're up against. <coughs> but when I talk about the, the reconnection of our minds, there there's a couple of things that as a family we have to be responsible for. One of those is the integrity of our community that is based on our ability to reconnect, to connect with what and where we come from. Because you gotta keep that connection together. <coughs> and I am so troubled by the fact that people say, uh, it takes a village to raise a child without giving that credit to it being an African folk tale, uh, an African <coughs> proverb. Mm -hmm. because, because it's connected to our ancient wisdom. And by reconnecting with our wisdom and reconnecting with our past, we can see some reflection of where we need to go. You know, there are times when I, when I reflect on where would Africa be had it not been just interrupted by slavery. Mm. I mean, for one thing, we wouldn't have square houses that would be dull. <laughs> you know, there would be color. Uh, there would be geometric shapes that were mm. different. Uh, there would be time. There would be rhythm because that's the kind of people that we are. So the way that, that we move would be inherent in the way that we construct what we believe and what we feel. So I was, I was dealing with the Somali thing the other day, and, you know, they said that they had burnt the libraries. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, I couldn't understand the truth of it. I couldn't understand why Islamic jihadists would go burn some books that ain't nobody reading, mm -hmm. that have not been translated, that have not really been circulated into the mainstream thought. So the only thing that can come to me is that, that there is a drive from somewhere to keep us from reconnecting with what that history represents. I do know this. I do know that if young people knew that we created math, they might not have as difficult a time trying to learn it. I do know that if our young people understand the amount of things that, they, that their history is responsible for, they might be motivated in a different way. So we cannot allow ourselves not to reconnect with where we are and tell it in a futuristic way. Mm -hmm. There's a sister that uh, from South Africa, and Floyd might be able to re help me remember her name, Pumzi. Uh, it's a film 
Uh, that's a, a, a futuristic film about the issue with water. Mm -hmm. and, this, and, and it's set in a futuristic Africa. It's a great film. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to look at the world in a way that we reconstruct our past and draw a path for the excitement of what we ought to be. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, I hear that. I yeah. hear that. that well, you know, a positive update, though, about the situation in Mali mm -hmm. is that I read that the, when the Islamists uh, came to town, uh, the first thing the villagers did was go and get a lot of the oh, yeah, uh, they, they, they salvaged and they salvaged and they hid yeah. it because they knew now, the first thing you do when the rebels come to town is the museums and the yeah, libraries. That's right. yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, now, this ain't yeah. the first time that's happened. No, that's right. Okay, yeah. this ain't the first time it's happened. No. This has happened several times over the last right. thousand years, right? Mm -hmm. This is this is this is really nothing new, right? But I think what we have to look at, Floyd, is why is it hidden. important? Why why is it important? Why is it important for the libraries? And well, the, well, well. That goes without. Burned. Well, I think it goes without saying because having been there and seen some of this stuff, and having been in people's homes in Timbuktu and seen the fact that they have actually, you know, it's like people got Bibles and Korans in their homes, right? Mm. Because they're mm. not, you know, because like they're not like that kind of religious. They're that kind of spiritual Syn syncretism. Yeah, yeah, right, a lot of right. Syn so, right, so, right, so then right, my question right, would be that syn syncretism for one. But mm. the other thing is like, let's look at who these people are, right? Who have gone back into Mali? This is blowback from Libya, right? Mm -hmm. These are people, Al-Qaeda members, who were hired, paid, and paid for by the U.S. government to go in and take down Gaddafi. Why? Because Gaddafi was trying to change the economic nature. He was trying to move the world from a, from a dollar-centric economic system to a other-than-dollar-centric economic system, all. right? He was trying to unify Africa, right? Gaddafi was putting a lot of money in, into different African nations, right? He was putting a lot of money in African banks, right? We're missing, we're missing part of the narrative here, okay? You, you this know, and, I, and I understand that. This is blowback, right? But my question is, if so someone invaded start, the South Side, would they burn down the libraries because they would be fearful? It, it all depends. That our folks would be all depends reading on what's in the library. No, but they burned down the DeSalvo Museum. Ah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. so you know, yeah. even well, though we may not use the DeSalvo yeah, Museum yeah, as much but, as we yeah, should, see, they would still to, burn it down yeah, regardless. See, I think we're going, I think we're taking And the Harold Washington bit, Cultural Center. We're well, talking about jihadists. We're talking about jihadists who made an alliance. We're, we're talking about... We're, we're talking about Islamic extremism, which made an alliance with the U.S. government against communism in 1953, right? We're talking about a movement that was, was nurtured by our <coughs> own government, right? Mm -hmm. Islam was actually, from the 1930s up to the 50s, was pretty progressive. You know, when I went to Afghanistan in 1975, I had a woman doctor. Folks ran, ran around there wearing dresses and wearing high heels. You know, people hung out at night. You know, they had nightclubs in, in uh, Kabul and all these places. You know, this stuff all changed. You know what I mean? It changed because Islamic extremism was financed and it was promoted. That's one, that's one reason. The other reason you know is the fall of the Soviet Union. The fall, the fall of the Soviet of, Union. The, is the fall of right. communism because most, right. many of these groups were secular. Right. They, they, they had secular uh, ideologies that, right. that fueled their, their uh, opposition. And then, so, com and then comes the new American century. Yeah, that's right. That's right. True. The yeah. whole neoconservative move that, towards, that towards right. the uh, neo And, 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 and Paymo, yeah. part of the problem that these, well, part of the reason why these jihadists are doing that in, in uh, Timbuktu too, is 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 ideological. I yeah, mean, it's they, they totally believe, ideological. They believe that um, you know that that's that's haram. You know that You're that's right. you know. But then I think we we also get to uh, back to what Pamela was saying about how do you regain your African mind? It's difficult when you and I'll go back to this when you have Africans that don't believe they're Africans. Right. Africans yeah. in Tanzania, yeah. uh, Salim and I were talking Persian. about that they believe they're Persian, mm -hmm. or Africans yeah. in the Sudan who believe yeah. they're Arab. Right. You yeah, know what but, I mean? So, yeah, but, yeah. but a lot of us when we travel to Africa, we're on the coast. Mm -hmm. right. We're on the coast mm -hmm. where everything mm -hmm. is metropolitan. Everything is cross. Mm -hmm. See, you got to do stuff like go into the part of Mozambique where ain't nobody ever heard of the United States. Yes, sir. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You, you got to go back into these hinterlands. You got to go back into these places. You want to find Africa. See, a lot of us go to Africa. We don't find it. Because we stay in the coast. You can't be in Nairobi. You know, you can't be in Dar es Salaam. You got to go out past Tonga. You got to go where Jackie Robinson's son is with that coffee farm, mm -hmm. with, with that mm -hmm. coffee plantation. That's where you find Africa. And when you see how successful 
Jackie Robinson's son is with that with, with that Unity Farms coffee thing, and you go up there we were trying, and, we were, and, we were and gonna, see that. We were going to develop a coffee uh, relationship with Uganda at one point. Yeah, so yeah. Couldn't do it. Yeah. Uh, well, hey, you know, we got to go so, to the phones. There's a lot of people want to talk phone. to you we, guys. We, we can do this all night. And let's see who, who we got first. Uh, uh, Corky. Uh, no, uh, yeah, Corky. Hey, Corky, how you doing? Corky? Hello? Going once, going twice. Corky's no longer there. Corky. Dwight, so, hey, my brother, Hotep. Hotep. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, what was the name of the book somebody mentioned about uh, American film industry uh, going worldwide? Floyd, Floyd Webb. Okay, um, hold on. I got to go back. Oh, my God. Um, oh, sh man. We're talking so much stuff. My, my head just went. <laughs> My head just went. Okay, there was two. Uh, David Putnam. David David Putnam wrote the book. David Putnam used to be the head of Sony, and he wrote this book, which outlined the CIA's influence and how they got involved in this thing, going all the way back in NPA. And I can't remember the title. Look up David Putnam, and um, oh my God, I'm sorry, but I can't remember. I can I can do that. David, uh, but, but David P U T T N A M. And uh, 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 not my indecision is final. He also has a book called My Indecision is Final, but it's but it's a book on the film industry, and I can't remember that title right now. Okay. Uh, but the other book is An Empire of Their Own. You really want to get that? Well, he, well, in it. fact, Dwight is one who reminded me of the that title. Oh, okay. Before, so yeah, but but the David one. Putnam book in a, in the U.S. has been <coughs> kind of suppressed because he talked a little bit too much about the CIA in it. Mm. But you can get it. Uh, I, I know I, I ordered a copy, uh, and I'm. And before the before the show is over, the uh, title's gonna come come back back to me. I can't get it right. Okay, now. okay. I'm I'm on Amazon. I'll be looking it up soon as okay. I hang up. Oh, okay. If, if okay. you guys if you guys could discuss, um, you know, with these uh, images, you know, I'm very critical of of the most of the movies, all the Hollywood movies, most of the music. Is, I mean, it's just terrible. But you know, but, I got a question. Well, hold on, no offense. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dwight. Okay, um, I, I just wanted to know your opinion on, you know, this comes up in my discussions with people uh, quite a bit, is the um, art uh, influencing the uh, society, is art imitating the life or life imitating the art, or you, you know, even do percentages if you think it's both. Well, All right, man. Good question, brother. Thank you. Yeah, but, right, thank you. But I got a question, though. It's like, what are we prepared to do to get the art that we want to see? Well, well let's, let, let's answer I, his question first. I think that, like, that's a yeah. philosophical issue. Yeah. That is this thing about like because like I think that these philosophical questions are the same ones we keep going over yeah, and, okay, I'm, and okay. I'm trying to fight against and I'm trying uh -huh. to fight against this tendency to be philosophical and not active. Okay, so, but okay, I mean, so, go, so okay. Well, I, I think well, you, I, you know, no, no, I, I, I do think that uh, there is a mixture of art imitating life and life imitating art. However, I, I, I do believe that the influence that corp that the corporations are having over our art and our life is is the majority that way to us than it is us to it. So what what happens is African Americans from life we create art. And then what, what, what the corporate infrastructure does is say, okay, now through finance and money, we're going to metastasize what we believe your life and your art should be and throw it back at you until we kill it. Until mm. we strangle your art, and then you know what you Negroes do: go create some more art. Mm. <laughs> okay. I, yeah. I now, it. in Brazil, back in the seventies, they had a uh, they had a military government who was censoring everything. Mm -hmm. So the artists, especially the filmmakers, they had a response. They couldn't make political films. So what did they do? They made subversive films, and they came up with a movement called Porno Chanchad. Right. It was soft core sex films with these political messages in it. Mm -hmm. Right. The censors didn't pay no attention to what was in the films because they were too busy looking at the images, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there is a so there's a subversive nature to it. I'm not I'm not promoting doing any porno shot thing mm -hmm. like that. But what I'm saying is that people find ways of making their messages known. Okay. Right? 
Especially if you're dependent upon one so source you mean, of money. So the, so the corporate mediator the corporate. is not is not the final is not the final word. Right. There so, are ways of subverting yeah. that. So it's it's like I like I had an argument with somebody the other day about the about the about the whole uh, subversive nature of Django. If there was a subversive nature, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? I think it is. I think anytime anytime you have somebody who comes along and takes Norse mythology and remixes it into a black Black exploitation mm-hmm. come, you know, black hero saving the uh, damsel where Siegfried becomes Django and then Brunhilde becomes uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, sister. That is subversive in itself, you know, okay. but you have to bring that to it in order to recognize that, right? Hey, when you don't know the power of mythology, because that's really what, what we're, 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 we're uh, talking about, is the power of mythology. We're talking about a mythic art. We're talking about something that engages Archetypes, us. you mean? Uh, mm-hmm. Archetype connection there. The archetype connections and, and all of the mythologies and legends and, you know, how we engage these things, you know? So, hey, Moon, how, how, what's your answer to this notion of uh, the, the, does art reflect life or life reflect uh, art? Or that, I'd, that I'd like to split them? my answer. Okay. <laughs> the first part would be that we are directly controlled by media in terms of what we eat, what we wear, how we look, how we deal with relationships, all of that is directly following, in my estimation, media. Now, what our lives are on a daily basis is impacted by poor schools, the political system, lack of education, or uh, other institutional issues that affect us on a daily basis. And I don't think that media has as much to do with that because whether you eat or not, you might not, you know, you might not even have any money to look at a television or go to see a film. Uh, the whole bootleg industry is a whole other issue. <laughs> um, but but I think that the impact on America is evident when when you look at how people wear their hair. You know, and then people say, "Well, I'm not influenced by the media at all," mm-hmm. but they've got the latest pink <laughs> hair following whatever her name is. On American, I Nicki don't know. Minaj. Nicki Minaj, yeah, and and then run around looking like Nicki Minaj. So you have been influenced. You might not know that you're being influenced, but every from everything from the way that we eat, to the way that we walk, to the way that we dress, to the way that we de- decorate our homes, is being led by what we see people do on on the screen. So so art so art is uh, what we um, you know loosely call art. Is 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 is, uh, is is directing society rather than the other way around? It's I think not it is. Okay, and I think that it always has. Mm. Uh, you know, you know what's interesting? I I was uh and I, and I say names, so you know, I I was at uh, uh Jimmy Kimmel's house, and, and there was a couple of us, <laughs> and we were sitting around talking, and uh, it was uh, another guy, Zach Galifianakis, who was in The Hangover, and uh, Jimmy Kimmel says to me, he says, "So you who smoked, who smoked the joint on uh, on Letterman's show?" Right? Exactly right. <laughs> so he says to me, uh, Jimmy says, uh, so you ran for office, Ryan Fest. Tell us about that. So I said, you know, I come from a neighborhood, the 20th Ward, and this is the issues. And Zach said, boring. <laughs> Tell us something that rich people care about. <laughs> and it was so funny <laughs> that I just had to laugh. And then Jimmy says to me, he says, you know, Ryan Fest, what are you doing? And I said, I said, well, what do you mean what, I'm, what am I doing? He said, you don't have to be there. You don't have to. You, you you're really stifling your potential by doing all of this crazy stuff. You're stifling who you could be. He said the only people that really matter is your family, your your immediate loved ones, and you. He's like you're trying to save the world and you're not going to do it. You you. He said you you could be here with us every day, but you just won't do what you got to do. And this was another moment of you know what. Like and, and, and these things every few years that keep happening in my life, right? And I notice them and, and I and I and I write them down and I mentally quote them and then you come back to the community, right? And and, and, and when you hear young people say the same thing to you mm-hmm. that they people that they don't even know they're in power are saying. You, you you realize that the fight that you have to fight and and me and uh, my my good friend Tom Burrell talk about this all the time. When I read Brainwash, I said, "Man, the fight that we have to fight is the same argument from both sides." Mm, dig that. That's an insight there. Yeah. <laughs> Let, let's go. Let's go to the phones. Jay has has been hanging on. Hotep, my brother, you got him. 
Hotep, Hotep, Celine. Yes, you sir. know the thing. The thing from listening to the brothers for the last period of time that they've been on is that it really boils down to how we define ourselves, who defines us, and the lack of culture. That that's really our problem. We, we back in the I would say the the eighties and the nineties. There was a strong movement of political consciousness coming about. You had black books and all of these things, wearing the kufis, the medallions, and all of that. When they saw that, along with positive rap music, was you know mobilizing some portion of the community in a sense. What they go and do is put forward the sexual agenda with these novels by Zane and some of the other. And they move aside from the cultural things that give us our identity. And unfortunately, we as a people got caught up in it. And, and since that point in time, we've basically become lost because we have no one that really defines our culture. It's always the Jimmy I beans that are defining culture. So he could use the N word in a conversation with Ron Fest and not get smacked in his mouth. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. He can create a Chief Keith to absolutely lead to the destruction of what's going on in Chicago. And there's no real counterbalance. And then when you have someone like Felipe who makes certain statements and do certain things, he's chastised by everyone. You, you, you so up, so you, that's you, really you, the problem. You, we you we have up, you no mentioned up Felipe Luciano Felipe Fiasco. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but I will tell you I'll tell you the thing about about what Lupe did when he made that statement at the at the pre inaugural uh, party and got escorted out, this is my problem with that. Right? It's one thing if if you dance at, at some point we have to turn the music off and turn the beat off and say I'm glad you enjoyed that performance. This is what I feel about this issue. And right now I'm walking to the. I want you to follow me, and we're going to get arrested tonight. Like, those are the statements. Like, when I decided that, okay, I'm going to run for office, I had to put the microphone down. I had to stop rapping, and mm -hmm. I had to make myself clear that this is the direction. that, mm -hmm. that We we have to uh, – I believe that Paul Robeson, when we look at the legacy of Harold Belafonte, when we look at the legacy of Dick Gregory, Dick Gregory didn't make his statement through telling jokes. He stopped telling jokes – and made a statement. So I, I just think that I, I love Lupe. That is my dear brother. But what I hope doesn't happen is that a single is on the way. Because what mm -hmm. what I see from, from what Lupe did is no one was talking about the Palestinians, which he was talking about in his song. Everybody was talking about Lupe. And, and, and so we have to, I think when we talk about these movements in art, we have to be careful that we aren't as fraudulent as the chief keeps that we criticize. Mm. Yeah, right. but, but but let me point this out to you, and maybe you'll catch it, and maybe you won't. Take your boy Kanye West. Uh huh. He got up and he said, "George Bush don't like black people or yeah. don't care about black people." Now look at the process. From where we've gone in the art form to where, as you will never, ever have a black artist saying anything that negative about Obama. And if you look at some of the things that Obama's doing around the world, they're just as bad as George Bush. And then what becomes of, Quan, um, of um, Kanye? He gets involved with the biggest media whore on the planet and impregnates her. So he's totally been being marginalized now by the dollar because when it's all said and done, five to ten years from now, he won't have no real voice in regards to what hip-hop is. Well, now, I, I, you got to look I, at I, the I bigger and the broader picture of this thing. I, all right, Jay. I, yeah. All right, Jay. Thank you, brother. Hotel, brother. Hotel, Hotel brother. And, and I could go on for, for days about uh, uh, how I would defend uh, Kanye uh, in ways that 
there are things that you see and there are things that you don't see. You know, that when I look at Kanye and the people that he has brought from Chicago into the music industry, there would be no Lupe fiasco if there wasn't a Kanye West that ushered him in on his first single. There would be no Rhyme Fest if there was no Kanye West that hopped on his song or took Jesus Walks and did this or did, you know, and made Jesus Walks what it was. Kanye in his uh, business has really put on, I mean, we could talk about Kim Kardashian, but look, we could talk about Jack Johnson and being him being a free black man, right? Uh, I've met Kim Kardashian, I've sat with her, and what it, there are things that you see and things that you don't see, and, and I guess what I would say in the media is just because you see Common being one way doesn't mean you ever seen him do it in Chicago. Just because you see uh, uh, Kanye in one light doesn't mean that he's not helping people on another light. There are many things in, uh, that, that I do in Chicago that are funded by Kanye West. So, you know, I, I think that we have to um, be a little more sophisticated right. in how we think about things that we see and things that we don't see. All right, all right. Uh, anything, Pamela? Well, yeah, I, I was just going to say that, you know, you you mentioned two examples. You mentioned uh, Dick Gregory, and you also mentioned Paul Robeson. Yes. And, and some Harry of that has, Fonte, and, yeah. and Harry. Yeah. All of those had to do with sacrifice. They yes. They sacrificed their careers to stand for something that they believed in. And it's really easy to go behind the scene and do good things, but in the in the center of the storm to reflect something that's altogether different. It is very difficult for us to be in this industry and stand up and really be a man. The poem, We Wear the Mask That Grins the Lies mm. and Hides Our Teeth and Shades Our Eyes, so much we do for hidden guile. We wear the mask. Mm. And we sacrifice that on a continuous basis. And so, it is very difficult for black folks to say what they really, really want to say and then keep getting the industry mm -hmm. and the mainstream media to support back what they say. I think it took Lupe, you know, because he's not an unintelligent person. Mm -hmm. So for him to stand up in that environment mm -hmm. and make that stand, he said, what the hell with my career? If it's gone, it's gone. But I'm going to say I don't I don't agree because Lupe has been doing this and been successful over this is his stick. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. No, I'm just saying. But but when, when you have a billion people and you're in the mid, and you're in the middle of the inauguration, it's one thing uh, at that moment to say it versus saying it in other environments. Well, I, he, he, well, like, it was a like pre inaugural party. I mean, let's not make it that it was the inauguration and that, that it was what it was. And it which, was a, which is being covered by media from around the world. Yes, and and I think I think that that's a good thing. But my thing is, as black people, and, and let me say it again. I love Brother Lupe. Lupe gives money to the community. Lupe helps children on the west and south sides of Chicago through his foundation. He has book clubs. He is an active member. I'm just talking about this one act. So in this one act, when we have the platform, we have to come with an agenda behind it, right? So you can't just make a statement and get escorted off and say, hey, look at what I did. When you have that, and he's a, because I know he's an intelligent brother, I'm saying this is a, a point where you could say, this is what we're going to do. If these artists, and, and this is why these artists like Lupe, I don't hold Chief Keith uh, accountable for this, but I do hold Lupe accountable for this. Lupe, Common, Kanye, they need to be connected with community organizers, right? So that when they make those type of statements, the agenda is already being carried out by those community organizers, and it moves our people to a better position, ultimately. Mm, but, okay. but the question becomes, like, how many, how many people have the, that kind of political maturity where would they get it from yeah, hey guess what yes. guess what we all bro the same way we yeah. sitting here at the table mm -hmm. I sit at the table with mm -hmm. those brothers right mm -hmm. and we have these Illuminati mm -hmm. discussions right <laughs> Illuminati <laughs> discussions right and, and what you find uh -huh. what you find is at the end of every day it's ego um, it's ego, right? Um, so smart people think this is what this is what I love about ignorant people. 
Ignorant people know that they got to stick together or it's not going to work. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They know this. You know, they know that, right? I love them for that. If we could just educate them, brothers. But the problem with education is everybody want to be the chief. Everybody can do it on their own. Can you imagine the power of Al Sharpton and Brother West together for, for black people? See, that, that, that's, oh, man. You know, that's one of the powerful things of the Nation of Islam. Is that it, sub- it forced people to submit many of their ego schemes mm. to to a, to another cause, the, the, regardless of what that cause was. You know, they 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 submitted their egos to that, and that, yeah, that makes you but, more, yeah, more yeah, but you know, yeah, but you know, but then you know, I go back to my old statement about the difference. You know, like that kind of um, that stick togetherness, mm. especially when it's not in knowledge, especially when there's no political sophistication oh, no, to it. I'm talking and about for strategic you, purposes. Yeah, I'm not yeah, talking, you know. yeah, 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 because um, then we have to go back to the whole brown shirt thing, too. For sure, know? absolutely. I mean, there's, so, a, there's a danger so in, the whole in, difference, in, in blind nationalism. So I'm, but, uh, uh, okay, let's go to uh, Brother Mel. Hey, Mel. Hey, Oh, man. Cell phone. Cell, phone. cell phone got bad on us while he was waiting. I'm sorry about that, my brother. Let's go to Maceo. Maceo, what's good. up? How are you, Celine? I'm good, man. Did you get my call? I certainly did, and right. I appreciate it. I, I will be calling you back. Okay. Uh, first of all, let me say hello to uh, Pay Moon, uh, Ryan Fess, and Floyd. And uh, Salim uh, and uh, the rest of you guys, uh, I agree with you 100% uh, Pay Moon in that uh, the way back to that African mind is through our history. And I advocate learning that history for our young people from the beginning of uh, the birth of humanity in Africa, the great Nile Valley civilization, Tarsetti, so forth, and come forth after learning about those great achievements, then learn where that was disrupted, and then come forth. Uh, Pay Moon, uh, the rest of you guys, uh, Floyd, uh, Ryan Fest, right here in Chicago, Pay Moon, uh, in terms of the DuSaba Museum, you know, the black metropolis is something that our young people right here in Chicago should know and have to know because that is something that can relate, it is relevant to them. Uh, the great Louis Armstrong, for instance, uh, and his wife, whose birthday is tomorrow, his second wife, uh, Lillian Harden Armstrong, uh, she was a band member in her own right. I mean, had her own band, uh, accomplished pianist, classical pianist, Composer. Do you have anything, uh, uh, Maceo, to, to oh, add? Oh, sure, uh-huh. sure. But you know, but I, the the point that I was trying to convey is that uh, because of her influence on pops, you know, he became the giant that he did. But I'm saying, in terms of uh, uh, the Dusabo Museum, that there's so much rich Black history right here, and you guys do a tremendous job. But could you incorporate? at some point into one of those exhibits, uh, the history of Black Metropolis. And yes, you know, we... <laughs> thank you, my brother. Th- thank you for the call, and mm-hmm. I appreciate all of your your comments. The museum uh, has a limited amount of space at this point. We're in the process of opening a, a, a new facility in conjunction with it, which will add an additional 66,000 square feet, so we will be able to address a number uh, of new exhibits that need to address our people. But let me just just add to to what you said. During the 60s, um, none of this stuff was done in a vacuum. And I I would go as far as to say that uh, the work of James Brown, the work of Marvin Gaye, the work of uh, a lot of the artists had a great impact on uh, what our people felt about themselves. And, you know, one one year I I was... thinking about Kwanzaa and say what what a great impact it would be if R. Kelly and and uh, Kanye and Rhymefest did a Kwanzaa album about the principles of the Nguzu Saba. Mm. Because unless our artists take on some of these issues, um, a lot of things will not necessarily change. You know, some of the institutions are, are extremely important, but it's the people that are behind the institutions that ultimately make the difference. And so we need centers of our culture, places where it is developed, where it is pushed. The greatest story of all time in terms of film, in my estimation, would be Halle Selassie's story or Marcus Garvey. Hmm. Will we ever get, a, get them done? They'd be a heck of a story. <laughs> it would be a hell of a story. Both of them. 
man. And, man. and hopefully somebody will pick that the, up. But the, the issue is, you know, a lot of young people are not buying into Kwanzaa, are not buying into, you know, the things that our elder generation finds important or cares about. Do you right? think it's important? But, do you, do I, but, you, I, but I think it's because of how it's articulated. Mm. Can If a young person says that they don't believe in unity, that they don't believe in self-determination, that they don't believe in, in, in uh, cooperative economics, if that they don't believe in faith and purpose and creativity, they're out of their minds. I, I, and yeah. so I'm just talking about the principles themselves. Now, you, can, you don't have to call it Kwanzaa. You can call it whatever you want. But our community has to stand up, and it is the unification of our community that's going to help to eliminate some of the problems that we got. Mm-hmm. We can call it Fuji Day if you want to. Mm-hmm. As long as we deal with the issues that they relate to. Mm-hmm. And values are an important part. Kwanzaa only represents values. But see, this is the problem with media, right? The problem with media is that Dr. King couldn't exist in the vacuum of social media today, right? Because what they would do is take his affair and say that everything that he did or said because he was an adulterer didn't matter, right? So we look at the creator of Kwanzaa, right? And and, and we, we find ways... Not saying it's right or wrong, but youth find ways to discredit every uh, people that come along, right? So, so for me personally, and in my opinion, Kwanzaa is too complicated. You know what I'm saying for me to follow because you know why? I got Twitter, and Twitter is 140 characters, and you, you, you know. So how do you deal with that, Pamela? You, you know, you know what I'm saying. I, I my think, mind I, can't fall. Can't I, I think digest. that I challenge somebody like Ryan Fest to say, "Make it simple, brother. You one of the greatest writers of our time. Mm-hmm. Break it down. Make it simple. Put it in those hundred, those 114 characters. Do you think characters. it's important to make it because simple? Because what's in, because what's important. Is not what Kwanzaa philosophically represents, which basically means the celebration of black people. What it represents really is a value system. We started this whole conversation mm-hmm. saying that, that young people need a value system. And that is what, what the principles of Kwanzaa represent. Mm-hmm. So, so let's take Kwanzaa and move it out the way and say we need unity. We need self-determination. We need self-sufficiency. We need self-respect. We need faith. We need purpose. Well, I, I think that that's happening. I don't, I don't think that that is absent. I think that when you look at artists like Killer Mike, who just released a song called Reagan, that's talking about Reagan great, great artist, great artist. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, his name is is off putting, but he yeah. He, he when when you look at Mickey Halstead, who just released the album called Castro, when you look at even Kanye West, you know, you look at uh, Jesus Walks, and you look at mm-hmm. you know songs where he in a song he says, uh, you know, we say Alu Alu Akbar and then go get us some hot cars. You know what I mean? I, I think when you look at Lupe and Common, these things, uh, these principles are being taught. Like Jay Electronica? Jay Electronica. I think we go back to the issue of, you know, did Reverend Jesse Jackson and Reverend Calvin Butts care about public enemy? So now we need our elders, like you, Pay Moon, and Hasaleem has embraced me, to embrace the artists. And uh, Lupe needs to be on the show. And he needs to be questioned and he needs to give answers. You know, I let's let's stop with because you're using your media platform, connect, Celine. Connect us, man. To, connect I will. Me. I will I'll give you his number after. So you're using your media platform to uh empower this, right? Black media has to start empowering yes, young artists that ain't on VH1 Absolutely. but have audiences. Absolutely. Yes, but at the same time, you have to, and I'm saying you being the artist that you are. You have to have the same kind of drive that we have every time there's a catastrophe. So when we do, when Haiti has an issue, then artists get together and they do something to help that. And they stand up for something because at some point they decide, okay, I'm going to stand up for something. I'm going to do a song about it. I'm going to put something together. Mm -hmm. And we need to mobilize our artists to have that same level of intent. Mm-hmm. when it addresses the problems, the social problems that relate to our community. But you have to pick catastrophes that matter to those artists, right? So, How about so, 2,400 kids getting killed in Chicago? I think that there are artists who, I, I know that there are artists who are addressing that, right? But when you look at, let's say, what's going on in Mali, right? The, the one thing that I fear, you know, the, the people say, Kanye needs to come back and address violence in Chicago. I don't want that because Kanye doesn't know enough about mm. the issue to not make it worse <laughs> like, mm. with whatever he says. You know what I'm saying? So there's a thing about 
artists who have the information, Kanye knows about art, right? So that when uh, Beyond Taylor Swift gets an award that Beyonce should have got, he can speak to the expertise of why. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a. Yeah, Beyonce should have got the award. You know, but he can't speak to this as well as I can or Lupe can, right? So you have to pick artists where their information matches what it is they should be doing, and let's I think go, they let, do. Let's that. go to another caller before we, because we can, we can, uh, you know, we can block out all these folks with this heavy <laughs> yeah. conversation. Cliff, good evening. How you doing, my brother? I'm all right, brothers. I'm all right. Great all right. conversation and rhyme fest. I, I, I can't even say no more about you, man. I remember the slice of pizza, so I don't even want to, even, you know, <laughs> you're just a, you're an MC, man, pure and simple. But um, one thing that kind of brought me, I guess, to this conversation, and I don't want to disrespect any of you guys with what I'm about to say, but I'm going to be honest and say that in the black community right now, especially with our youth, one thing that I think we need to talk about, talk about, and talk about again is the amount of sexual abuse that's going on. The kids basically do not want to hear all of this knowledge because you have a lot of them, and, and it, I'm getting choked up thinking about it, but you have a lot of them that have gone through sexual abuse that was depicted in those two movies you guys spoke of earlier. Precious and... So, so, yes, Precious and Red Hood Summer. Mm -hmm. Salim, I know a preacher like that. Unfortunately, he got my niece pregnant when she was 14, and she had an abortion. He had a couple of other women pregnant that were underage, okay? And there were rumors about him and young boys. Mm. Precious, I've seen that. I have seen that, Salim. I've talked to a family just recently within the past couple of months. I was wondering why this kid was so angry. He was a big, strong kid, and he was just angry. And the kids in his family had to sleep with each other because they were scared of him coming into that room and touching on them. Mm -hmm. Well, what ended up being found out, because I had to talk to this guy. He's a big guy. And I'm not that big, but this is a young man. So I'm like, okay, I'll, I can take you out if I want to, but I got to see what's making you so mad. Mm -hmm. And what ended up happening was that his father married um, someone. And just like in the scene from um, Sweet Badass's movie, it happened to him. So all he knew to do was to replicate what he saw until <clears throat> someone talked to him about it. Mm. The sexual abuse, we cannot be dismissive of it. And the way that we are being dismissive of it as intellectuals is reminding me a lot of what these sick Catholic preachers have done. Mm. I went to a Catholic school. They wanted to kick me out because I'm not going to swim naked with you freaks. Okay. There's no reason to swim naked. Okay? I went to Finwick, Ron Fest. That's what they wanted to do. And they almost kicked me out. But you know what? Kick me out. Because right. I'm not about to, I'm not about to do that. But I'm just saying, real quick, we cannot be dismissive of this. It is All right. really that is absolutely a good point, brother. Thank well, you. I, Appreciate it, that. And not only is it a, a great point, mm -hmm. I don't think we're being dismissive of it. I think he added it to the conversation of mm -hmm. what needs to be talked absolutely about. And, right. and I, I'm not afraid to mm -hmm. embrace it. And mm -hmm. I, and I totally agree. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, when you look at the stripper culture of rap music, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Every song that is on the radio, if it don't got a stripper beat, you're not going to get on the radio without a song that is a stripper song, mm -hmm. which perpetuates uh, the abuse and, 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 and makes young women and we haven't talked about young women we haven't even talked about revolutionary black women in this conversation that, that are artists right mm -hmm. or right. filmmakers but but I think that you have we're in a situation gotta get where, some sisters in here yeah, incidentally yeah. why don't we have any female rappers like Lauren Hill, like MC, like in mm. fact, why can we only name three female rappers in That's the history right. of rap That's music right. that that are worth a damn, right? So, so sexual abuse is is definitely something that you know. I was in high school not too long ago, and when you look at the, what the young women are wearing, when you look at the fact that young women are pregnant. And as juniors, and, and and it's a it's a it's regular, it's normal. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I grew up with my mother. My mother had me uh, when she got pregnant at, at fourteen. She had me on her fifteenth birthday. Wow. We have the same birthday. My mother and I grew up together. And this is what a lot of young people. I, look, look I, a young rapper recently died. I went to go speak with his mama. She was she was hot. You know what I mean? And 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 I'm thinking you dealing with this. You know, she can't guide this guy because she's got a boyfriend that's the same age as the son, mm -hmm. daggone near. And these children are in living situations, not in parental homes. We talk about it's the parents, it's the parents. Okay, the parents ain't there. Now what you going to do? Right. And well, let's deal from there. Right. And you know, yeah, my, my partner, Masekwa Myers, um, who runs the Teen Talk Radio Theater, did a survey at South Shore 
um, high, that's not Shore, but the other one, um, the other one's a little further south, so, so I won't name it. But anyway, um, so we were trying to decide when talking to these kids, what was the biggest issue that was impacting them? Mm -hmm. CVS. With CVS, CVS okay. And so we thought it was going to be gangs or violence or drugs or something like that. Mm -hmm. But they said the biggest thing that they were facing was the old men driving by the school to pick up these young girls wow. when they got out. Wow. And that it was such the a Mel predatory syndrome. state mm. that it was... It, that was the biggest issue that they were facing. Wow. And they said every day they were lined up, offering them money with these nice cars, trying to pick up these young girls. Mm -hmm. Wow. Hey, well, let's, uh, let's go back to the phones. Julian, good evening. You're on the Talk of Chicago. How you doing, bro? Julian, are you there? This is Christine. Oh, I'm sorry. Christine, how are you? I'm sorry. I'm fine, and you? Yeah. Uh, I want to say good evening to everyone. Good evening. Good evening. And, um... I, I'm calling regarding uh, one of the brothers in the studio mentioned about diabetes and about his go way back. Mm -hmm. And sure. it's confirmed <laughs> somewhat uh, what I have believed that diabetes, white black people, they say, have be majority diagnosed with that disease. Mm -hmm. Because when I was in, in a library, I was reading what they... Uh, the meals of the slaves, the enslaved on the ship uh, and bringing them over to North America for breakfast. Uh, according to the book, they gave them um, rice and corn, and so that's carbohydrates, sugar, sugar. Then for their lunch, uh, in the book they call it supper, they gave them uh, molasses and that's sugar again mm. and then for supper for dinner they gave them about somewhere about the same type of meal mm -hmm. so from that for being a nurse uh, RN uh, it just blew my mind and uh, it's just like oh this is where diabetes come from mm. it goes back uh, multiple years ago from the slaves when they the way the master fed them on the ship by giving these food with the carbohydrates that turns into uh, sugar. So I was glad to hear that someone else had got insight regarding that. Thank you, Christine. You know, Appreciate you know the thing about diabetes, I have diabetes, and I know it's going to be the death of me. I feel it every day in my body. I feel how it affects mm. my mood. I'm annoyed at people. I have less patience than I had before I was diagnosed with diabetes. How long, uh, how long have you been diagnosed? After the election, I, uh, I, I fell out. I couldn't feel my limbs. I couldn't wow. walk. Uh, I almost went into a coma. And my son had to pick me up and take get me on the bus. And he, he took the bus with me to the hospital. And my sugar was 940. And uh, they said, sir, you are about to die. And they said, do, do you know you're diabetic? And I said, huh? Because to stay up during the election, I had to drink Pepsis all night. Oh, and and I activated it. And so what, well, you know, but the thing about my diabetes is the hardest thing is me retraining my, because I, I take pills. I was on insulin and now I'm to pills. And the doctor said, you can beat this. He said, but you just won't eat right. And, and you know, and, and for me, it's uh, it definitely what the what the, the, the last call is, is, it's diet. And so, you know, I, I, I know that now because I'm in my young 30s that, you know, I'm, I'm I'm not really feeling it, but I can feel now that when I'm 60, I got a problem coming. Mm. And so I'm trying to help and train myself, and it's the hardest thing out of all of this stuff we're talking about. The diet changes? My diet. Yeah, yeah, out yeah. of all this revolution we're talking about, mm -hmm. my diet well, you know, is the hardest you, thing, and it's my death that yeah. I feel looming over used to me. Say, how do you used to say it? Anybody who weighs over 200 pounds is not ready for the revolution. Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know. My man Miles here is about 300 pounds. I think he's ready back there. And, and very, you know, very seriously, uh, diet and exercise Exercise is extremely important, yeah. and you can't get a, away from it. But also, yeah. how we train our children in the world, because you find uh, parents putting sugar in water, mm -hmm. 
uh, or, or, or feeding them, you know, so that they'll drink water. Yes. Uh, you find us giving them sweets really, really early, yeah. and if you give them, if you give them the right type of food, then they won't crave That's the right. ones that are bad. That's right. But we just have this tendency to do what was done to us when we were young. We've been socialized yeah. that way. We have been. Point out, man. We have been. Let's go back to the phones, Mel. Hey, man, how you doing? Hey, hey, I'm uh, glad to hear from you guys, but I'll make it short and brief. But, yeah, you know, sugar was something you get for kids because you didn't get much else. You didn't get some candy. You know what I'm saying? That's right. Some babies got to get So it. That, that was all part of it. But I was listening to Ryan Fest and I and earlier, and you were talking about what it takes to, to make it to be successful you know, on the radio or, or you know, in, as an artist. And, you know, sensationalism sells, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, and so does. And then um, from sensationalism, you get exploitation, you know? Mm-hmm. we got to do it over and over and over again, you know, because it's a, it's a, it's a a, it's a formula, you know. Mm-hmm. But my whole thing about community is that, just going back to basics, we need to make the community safe for children. You know, if we can make our community safe, that then we can concentrate on these values that I believe have diverged into more commercialism, you know, and things that really are not that important. Because the things that you love today when you're young are not going to be the things that you want or need when you get old, you know. So the main thing is we need community. We need to get these streets safe for children. That's that's what I believe. All right, my brother. Yeah, and, and, and I totally agree. But the, the only solution to getting our community safe for children is for fathers who have been emasculated to shake off the shame and come back. Like, <laughs> unless, you know, and, and look, man, I've been through the courts. I know how the courts call you everything but a child of God. I know how, you know, when you go in and we got bad relationships with our baby mamas, I got two of them. You know what I'm saying? And, and I and what I've learned is that you got to eat the crow. You got to learn that they you know, to, to deal with them in a way that the children can respect you no matter what the mother or whoever the parent is thinks about you. Shake the shame off. Fathers have to come back, stand up. We And, and, and if you deal with Lil Raheem who stole uh, Lil JoJo's bike, the police won't, the, the police will let you do it. Got gotcha. you. You know, and, and, and we, we didn't get into this, Ryan Fest, but you, you have a very fascinating story about finding your father uh, in the streets of Chicago. which, which Homeless on the west side. Mm-hmm. And, and I learned a lot about the west side. You know, when, when I found my father after 30 years and he was homeless on the west side, I said, I said, Dad, I said, you from the south side. How'd you end up on the west side? What do you know about? I don't, don't nobody know about the west side. <laughs> so you know what he said to me? He said, son. He said, you know, I felt that way until I became homeless, and I realized the west side is family. The (laughs) south side is for people with money. And he he said, I said, what do you mean? Mm. He said, the west side of Chicago got jobs for people like me. At the Catfish Corner, he said, Wallace took me in and fed me. Wallace took me in and fed me Mm -hmm. when I was hungry. I couldn't find that, you know, on the the south side. And I started, so now what I'm doing is I'm starting this really, uh, this research on the difference between the west side and south side and why people from the south side don't venture over to the west side, but the west side knows us oh so well. Like, <laughs> Just a little bit of information during the Great Migration. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people from Mississippi went to the south side and a lot of people from Alabama went west. Mm, check just that. Okay, let's go. One, one more, one more we'll caller before we finish up. Mel, hey, man. Is it, no, this is not Mel. No, this is Julian, right? Yes, yeah. right. yes. Yeah. Hey, Julian. All right, peace, brother. Peace. Uh, I know I don't have much time, That's right. but I, uh, maybe the creator had the sister call and start talking about health. Uh, Brother Che, I saw you in the uh, theater for the Soul Food Junkie sale, yes. and I'm deeply involved involved in the uh, urban agriculture, I, I should say, movement in the city. And I think there needs to be more synergy involved with brothers like myself, you, Brother uh, Floyd there, and the other brother I'm not familiar with. Hey, that are involved Rami. with mm-hmm. yes, that are involved with the uh, the young folks in our community. Uh, we're doing good work in trying to demonstrate actual uh, uh, benefits through our efforts through agriculture that will benefit the community as a whole. So a lot of the produce we go we grow goes to benefit black businesses in Chicago. Brother Mailman, it's too bad. That, I mean, Brother Junior, it's too bad that you, you you are the last caller because we don't have much time, and that's an extremely, extremely important subject that you bring up, Brother. Uh, and and uh, we're going to talk about it at, a, uh, at another time. So thank you for bringing it up. And uh, look up the film Grown in Detroit. Yes, sir. Grown in Detroit. 
Brothers, uh, a, a quick a quick 20, 25 second uh, sum, summary of, of uh, you know what we've been talking about the, tonight, if you can. Floyd, you first. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go back to one thing. Mm-hmm. What, uh, what uh, Elijah Muhammad said we have to do for self in terms of creating these images, mm-hmm. in terms of creating all of the content, you know, uh, and stop complaining about somebody that ain't did something.